Tradoon.
research is required. It's why paleontology is such an exciting science. It's like we're always learning new things all the time. skeleton. Um, really, really cool. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizer. It's good to have you here. I'm going to turn my lights on properly. I, uh, sorry I'm a little bit late today. Just getting back from the museum in Berkeley a little while ago, where I saw some really cool talks this morning. It's been a good day. It's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome, everybody. If you're here for the very first time, then let me give you an extra special welcome. Let me introduce myself real quick, too. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, what I dig up during the summers. This past summer, we were out digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and Utah and live streaming it. Check out the YouTube page if you want to see some of those, those uh, recordings. We had at least three new species of dinosaur this past summer, probably more, but we'll say three for now. And those are currently being worked on and hopefully will be published in the next few years. Uh, more fieldwork streams expected this summer, too. Anyway, when I'm not in the field, I am here in my office in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm talking about fossils. I stream five days a week here on Twitch. This is, believe it or not, my full time job. Call me the world's first full time live streaming paleontologist. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you wouldn't be wrong. My whole point here is, like I said, to do science outreach. To talk about fossil science, to... We've got a amazing 70 million year old dinosaur. Lunasir? And they're perfectly preserved. Mm -hmm. Cool! Oh, I can't. Shout out to SFO, Valio Dance. SFO, the, the international airport, Lunasir? Yeah. Yeah, how are you doing, Luna Sierra? Thank you for the 20 months of support. I really appreciate keeping me online for that long. Holy cow. Supporting this mission of, of science outreach and education. Uh, the whole point of these broadcasts is to try and give you an inside peek into how paleontology works. Whether we're talking about new discoveries, new publications, whether we're doing tours of museums or fieldwork live streams, whether we're interviewing other paleontologists like yesterday. How many of you were here for our interview with Ethan Calgill yesterday? Um, or whether we're just doing good old fashioned Q&A on this channel, you know? Getting your questions answered. Whether those questions happen to be about dinosaurs in particular, that's my specific research wheelhouse is dinosaurs. Or whether it's questions about broader topics in natural history. Extinction, evolution, the origins of biodiversity, or uh, questions about larger ideas, philosophy of science, stuff like that. We're here to discuss all these things. And given that this is a live broadcast, interactive, you can type into the chat, I can answer your questions live. That's, uh, that's what this whole thing is about. Now on today's broadcast, we're going to be focusing especially on whales cetaceans those giant marine mammals they didn't start off marine and we'll be talking about that whales used to have legs as you will see today there's a wonderful new documentary that came out from uh from pbs nova it's on youtube we'll be watching it we'll be learning it together i don't specialize in whales so i'll be learning some things too but uh i think one of my old crewmates might actually be in that video, too. We'll see. Because it is uh, it is set in Egypt. It's a documentary about Wadi al-Hitan, the Valley of the Whales. Fossil whales in the middle of the Egyptian desert. You'll see. But before we get to that, we're going to do some Metazoa. And before... Actually, no, Metazoa will be at 4 o'clock. 
so I guess it'll be after we start that. But let me go through chat real quick and say hello to everybody. Uh, it appears Matt M33 was here first today. Welcome, welcome, Matt. Kodali, howdy, howdy. It's good to see you. Golganek, what's shaking? Lovely to see you as always, Golganek. Thank you for uh, gracing us with your presence, as usual. We've got the Lenina. How are you doing, Lenina? I hope work is going well today. It's good to see you. Uh, loads of people in town for work. They all want to go out for dinner. Nice, Lenina. Enjoy. Yeah. And Golganek has already watched this documentary. Well, Golganek, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hope you don't mind. We'll be uh, taking a look at it again. Going off on all kinds of cool tangents and stuff. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, and Cyant Streams. Belant, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Howdy, howdy. Um, I hope your week is off to a good start, Belant. It's always good to see you. Hope, uh, Lita and Ilona, the cats are doing well, too. Uh, Bella Messina, how are you doing, Bella? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, Fall Machine, Sandwich Nom Nom, Niffler, and Portugask, Linux Witch, and Nianza. How are you all doing? It's wonderful to have you here. We've got Rosand. What's shaking with you, Rosand? Good to see you, as it always is. Shinken Godse, how are you doing? Hello, hello. And uh, Fake Alex Jones says, I actually have a whale bone in my backyard. Very cool. Do you live near the coast? Or is did that, did that whale bone travel a long, long distance to be there? Um, cool stuff. Yeah. A friend of mine used to have a whale vertebra that was used like as a doorstop, basically front entrance to his uh, his place in San Francisco. Um, it was very lightweight, so it didn't make the best door stop, but it was there next to the door. Phoenix the Archaeologist, how are you doing? Howdy, howdy. A coelacanth emote. Somebody else on Twitch already has coelacanth emotes, and I don't, I don't want to make it seem like I'm copying them. I don't know. But I do like the idea. We'll see. We'll see. If I could do like a swimming coelacanth, very costly business nowadays to articulate a dinosaur. God smile. Thank you, thank you, Delta Rain, for those 500 bits. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Delta. Appreciate you. I hope you're having a good day, Delta. It's good to see you. I hope your week is going well. I hope the house hunt is going well, too. Um, yeah, Wombat Hole, how are you doing? Spent no expense. And Trappy, Trappy Jenkins, Jenkins, thank you for that gift sub. One sub to the underscore lies. I do appreciate that, Trappy Jenkins. Thank you, thank you. Look, we are we are almost at one third of the way to our uh, our sub goal here for the week. Excellent, and it's only Tuesday morning practically. Yeah. Uh, uh, Paleo Lord says finally time for a wonderful paleontologizing stream. It's good to have you here, Paleo Lord. Welcome, welcome. Did I say hello to you yet, Mayor of Space? Good to see you, Mayor Space. How do you Thank you for being here, as always. Uh, we've got Neil. We've got Paleo Stream. Paleo Stream says best intro yet. I'm glad you liked that one, Paleo Stream. That was actually the first, like, opener video that I ever did. Um, I'm glad you like it. It needs some. I would like to do an, an updated version of it at some point, but uh, yeah. Gene Wen and Tea Time Cat. Uh, Cliff Alistair McLean, hello, hello. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Oh, I often do, Golganek. Thank you for the hundred bits there. It does appear to be time for a hype train. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, someone was commenting on, Paleostream was commenting on some of the art here. Yeah, this is actually done by an old friend of mine, Robert Bosenecker. Good old Bobby B. Um, do this. I forget the... With the genus name. costly business nowadays to articulate a dinosaur. Let's go. All right, Delta, let's go. <laughs> Another 500 bits for a total of 1,000 from Delta Rain. Thank you, thank you, Delta. Holy cow. Really appreciate it. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Yeah, I forget the genus name for that new whale. That might be one of the ones that's being discussed in the documentary. But I know the species name is Anubis, which is pretty cool. Um, deals with it being from uh, from Egypt. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lady Fiend says, I thought it was cool to see a fellow Utahn on your channel yesterday. Yeah, Lady Fiend, there will be more where that came from. <laughs> Just you wait. 
We're going to try and make uh, interviews a weekly thing here on Paleontalogizing. So, I'm excited about that. Uh, good stuff. Displacer, how are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Much I love to do. everything you do for the community. Thank you, Itsy Bitsy Bones, and thank you for those hundred bits supporting this community. I appreciate that, Itsy Bitsy Bones. Good to see you back. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, and Mary Spaces, I don't have any whale parts, but I have video of dolphins I met while kayaking. That's actually super cool, Mayor Spaces. I've never met a dolphin while kayaking. The best I've ever done was like a bat ray, which is still cool. Yeah. Paleo Stream says, hello, Danny. Nice to be here. I'm currently filled with noodles and spite. That sounds like a good combination. Paleo Stream? Oh, Paleo Stream, while well, you're here, actually. Here, check this out. You know that, uh... That thing that's been making the rounds on Twitter with the that awful... Uh, draw realistic dinosaurs like AI generated book. Um, this kind of goes against some of my principles, but I promise I'll make up for it. I uh, I bought that the other day, and uh, oh man, oh here it is. I do plan on returning it, but we will be looking at this on an upcoming stream. And I'll be writing a review, probably a one star, very, very candid, very um, honest review of this. It's the first time I'm looking through it. Oh, this is awful. Ugh. Ugh. I'll show you later, everybody, but. Yeah, one of these garbage... Look, just the cover tells you pretty much everything that you need to know. How to draw realistic dinosaurs. This is all, like, AI-generated. Look at the... What the... What? Uh, Mi Mini Pie, can you believe this? Can you believe that? Yeah, so we'll be having a special stream about that coming up. Um... Yeah. Yeah, not good. Not good. Here, let's let's put this to the side. Yeah, oh, oh, mini pie. Get some aggressive cuddles there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Oh, what are you looking around at? What do you see, mini pie? What do you see? <laughs> Though it may not seem like much, 500 bits goes a long way towards supporting science. I'll keep here on Twitch. <laughs> I appreciate that, Delta. Thank you, thank you. For the uh, additional 500 bits. Delta Rain, this is impressive. What do you think, Mini Pie? You impressed? I'm impressed. Don't climb on my chair. This is not a place for you to climb. We talked about this, Mini Pie. We, we discussed this. Not a place. There you go. The desk is fine. But I don't want you clawing the chair anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Just making sure everything is up to code. Yeah, she's going to try and climb on. But you better not try and climb that sawfish roster, Mini Pie. That would not go well for for you or for Ed or for anybody, you know? Yeah, not not ideal. <laughs> Are you appreciating the uh this cat interaction right now, everybody? Yeah, mini pie. Can I get you a treat? Treat? What do you think? Oh, yeah, you know what that is. Let's get you some of that. Yeah. Oh, here you go. Put that right there. Did you eat it or did you knock it off the desk? Did you knock it off the desk? 
You knocked it off the desk. Here. Right here. Eat that. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look at you. The camera loves you, Mini Pie. The camera loves you. So yeah, everyone, for those of you who are not aware, this is one of my landlords here. I moved into this place back in December, and Mini Pie was here before I was. So I had to gain her approval before moving in. And uh, what do you think? Am I doing a good job? Do you like the topic for today? Do you want to talk about whales? Yeah, let me give you the other treat that you knocked off the desk. There you go. Eat that. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, whales are always good. They, they often are. Paleo stream. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can't hate on whales. Even if they do cheat when it comes to the whole body mass weight thing, by virtue of being marine. But that's okay. That's okay. Whales are still special. Yeah, they might be my favorite ungulates, actually. Whales. Them and chevro chevrotans are also very cool. Yeah, wow, it's it's not common that you're here for this long, Minnie Pie. Uh, Lego Bacillosaurus, very cool dinosaur day. Very, very cool. And Charlie's Dragon says if whales ch uh, cheat with the weight, Peregrine Falcons may not cheat seem with the like much. Five hundred. That's fair, Charlie's Dragon. Way towards supporting science. I'll preach here on Trish. And Delta, holy cow, another 500 bits there. I do really appreciate that, Delta. I really, really do. Holy cow. That is excellent. Well, uh... You're just gonna hog the whole screen, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thanks for dropping by, Mini Pie. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um. Excellent. Shall we go ahead and? Uh... Oh, and hang on. We had a. a... A question earlier that someone dropped if the Loch Ness Monster is a dinosaur? Um, sometimes. Yeah, here, let, let me show you. Um... Yeah, some Loch Ness Monsters are dinosaurs. Like this one. And, uh, and this one. And, uh... And this one, too. Those are cormorants, which are dinosaurs, and they're probably responsible for a fair number of Loch Ness monster sightings. So yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah, sometimes the Loch Ness monster is a dinosaur. Um, but then we had a question too about snakes. Are snakes from the dinosaur times? We talked all about this the other day at Trade as Many. We uh. We had a whole stream about that on National Serpent Day. We were talking all about snakes, both extinct and extant. Um, but yes, yeah, snakes did first evolve during the age of dinosaurs, probably in like the Jurassic period. And I was wearing the same shirt that day, wow. Um, anyway, yeah, here, here's a link. If you would like to take a look at that, because it's sad and dumb. And, uh, we can... Anywho, good stuff. Uh, plesiosaur isn't a dinosaur. There you go, science streams. Yeah, plesiosaurs are not dinosaurs, though. If, uh, if anybody's wondering about that. Yeah, plesiosaurs. These are marine reptiles from the age of the dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs themselves. They belong to another group of reptiles that took to the seas, became marine, never looked back. 
they evolved to the point where they could actually give birth to live young in the water. They didn't have to, to haul themselves up on the beach like a sea turtle to lay their eggs. They gave birth to live young in the water. Super cool. A lot like whales. So yeah, and uh, why don't we go ahead and, and get into whales here, shall we? Um, but yeah, yeah. And please, these are your favorite. Oh, very cool, Itsy Bitsy Bones. They're really cool. They're really cool animals. If I didn't work on dinosaurs, Elasmosaurs might be my uh, my next choice. You know. Um, these critters. The very, very long-necked plesiosaurs from the, the late Cretaceous. Super cool critters. Elasmosaurs. They had the most neck vertebrae of any creature that's ever lived. They can have up to like 76, I think is the record. 76 vertebrae. Uh, pretty awesome. Yeah. But yeah. And Rachidactylus, it's good to have you here. It's actually a beautiful day here in the Bay Area. Um, beautiful day in the Bay Area. I was in Berkeley earlier, and uh, look at that. Super clear. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge. I actually took a photo earlier today uh, of just that, and it's... Uh, it's not popping up. Oh, but here's a lovely photo from yesterday. Yesterday was colder. It rained at times, but there's a gorgeous rainbow over San Francisco. Yeah, imagine that. A rainbow in San Francisco? Unthinkable. But here it is. Yeah. Uh, really wonderful. This is from across the bay, from Alameda Island. Went there to go walk at the beach and photograph some birds for Thursday Birds Day. So yeah, yeah, very nice. I love a good rainbow. Um, 76, that's more than four tens. It's, it's almost twice that, Rosanne, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in talking about elasmosaurs, these guys had such absurdly long necks. We think for, for predation, to be able to, uh, to grab critters like fishes or squids uh, without having to you know have your body right up against them if you can just kind of sneak up on prey like that because you know rather than this big huge barrel shaped body coming toward a fish if you can like move a little bit more slowly just have a long neck like that. You can kind of snake it into a school of fish and just grab them, maybe without scaring them away. That's the idea that I always heard about this. Um, but yeah, they're really cool critters, elasmosaurs. And uh, some of you were here for that stream, my first stream from Wyoming last summer, where we saw an elasmosaurus skeleton. That was pretty cool, too. Um, it's not in this playlist. It'd be in this one. Yeah. Stegosaurus? Probably not. Elasmosaurus. There we go. Stegosaurus. Let's go see a non dinosaur next. Check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. is an elasmosaur. So this is a huge ocean going reptile that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. Elasmosaurus is from the late Cretaceous period of North America. Remember this stream? Yeah, the bees. This is a good one. Of the plesiosaurs. An unexpected stream. Yeah. Um, there's one flipper right there, one of the hind flippers. There's that tail, fairly short tail. Check out this rib cage. Just big, big barrel shaped body. Huge. Um, pretty impressive. But that is not the most impressive thing about long necked plesiosaurs like that. The most impressive thing, obviously, is the long neck. So let's take a look at this. 
it just check that out going uh, this is one of the longest necks of any ocean animal that's ever lived elasmosaurs actually hold the record for having the most vertebrae the most you know uh, uh, neck bones. I, uh, most cervical vertebrae of in the oceans all bets are off you know um, some of these guys have it's international waters cervical vertebrae 70 neck bones so uh maybe in a minute we'll try and count them is that cool take a look at that bones? There yeah are some lovely fishes here too probably a little bit too big for this animal to swallow but i don't know how much their jaws could expand in the back huh. but anyway later on it's quite riveting i try and count the number of vertebrae uh, if you'd like to see that here is a link there uh uh good stuff But the whole reason, you know, why we're uh, streaming today is, well, to talk about fossil whales. So without further ado, let's get into that, because this is kind of a longer documentary. And, uh, yeah, 54 minutes. And knowing me, this is going to take a minute to get through. So we might as well... Start it up here, shall we? Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. Oh, and we had another question too. I think Delta was asking if that that like large number of neck vertebrae would make these animals more vulnerable. Um, probably not because they were hugely successful. Elasmosaurs lived all over the world, you know, North America. I don't know about South America, but uh, New Zealand, Antarctica. Uh, I'm sure other places as well. I don't know. I'm not super well versed in my elasmosaur, uh, biogeography, but chances are they were cosmopolitan. They lived all over the world. So pretty, pretty, pretty successful creatures. They were kind of the whales of their day because this was long, long, long before whales evolved. Here. Show you let's go to linear time here on our chronostratigraphic chart. Um, yeah, elasmosaurs are mostly from the, or maybe exclusively from the Upper Cretaceous. But I don't know, elasmosaur ancestors, some other plesiosaurs, may extend into the Lower Cretaceous as well. But anyway, this is really their heyday. And Elasmosaurus proper is from the Campanian, I believe. So from about 80 million years ago to about 70 million years ago, something like that. Now, the whales that we're going to be talking about today, I think, are from the Eocene or Oligocene. And so, in the grand scheme of things, I guess it's not that much longer after that, but it is after. Right here where you get this transition from blue to yellow from the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic era. You've got a massive asteroid that strikes the Earth, and just like this cat here, holy cow. What are you doing, Mini Pie? Yeah, uh, just arrives like a... like a cat blocking out the camera. And that asteroid... threw up a tremendous amount of dust, caused global wildfires, soot everywhere in the atmosphere, blocked out the sun, dropped global temperatures. There was kind of a nuclear impact winter, I guess you could call it. Or an impact winter. Kind of akin to, like, a nuclear winter. But about, you know, between 60 and 85% of life on Earth died out at that time. Well, Minnie Pie has found a Mesozoic mammal here. Look at that, Minnie. Look. Yeah, a Morgan Yucodon. Or Morgan Yucodon, as I've heard an actual mammal person pronounce at one time. Look at that. I just 3D printed this the other day. I maybe printed it a little bit too large. Look, Minnie. Look at that. 
That's a Mesozoic mammal. It's one of our ancestors, Minipi. When I say ours, I mean collectively. You and me both. Well, actually, Morgan, you... Morgan Eucodon, Morgan Eucodon, probably not a direct ancestor of modern mammals. But, yeah, these guys were egg layers. Look at that. What do you think? Ancestor of whales, too? Yeah, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. Well, Mini Pie, should we go ahead and start this documentary here? I think that's a good idea. Again, I don't know how long this is going to take to go through. So let's start it up, shall we? There we are. When Whales Could Walk. Full documentary from PBS Nova. Good stuff. In the sands of the Egyptian desert, experts are uncovering clues to a lost past. Look at this, right here. From a time long before the pharaohs, when this nice place Katera. was cool. underwater, and whales had legs? Yep. Here's the hind limb yeah. of this beast. It's Such just like T-Rex hand. Do nothing. <laughs> Believe this, did you? Whales yeah. are the world's biggest mammals. But how did they end up in the ocean? This is so awesome. They're doing everything mammals do, but in the water. Now, what do mammals do, Mini Pie? discoveries are revealing clues about their evolutionary past. What do they do? Oh, my lord. When I first saw it, I had no idea what it was. From prehistoric predators to the largest animal that has ever lived. How did the whale's journey begin? It's one of the greatest stories of Any evolution. Pie. Stop it. When whales could walk. Right now hey. on Nova. Off the chair. Off the chair. Can't have her scratching up the chair with her claws. Wadi Hitan, train her not to Egypt's do that. Sahara Desert. Hidden beneath these rocks are secrets from a time long before humans. There we go. So this is really, really lovely. Um. One of my crew chiefs this summer, Don DeBlue, the assistant state paleontologist for the state of Utah, uh, he has gone collecting at the Fayum in Egypt, um, which is a similar valley to this, and almost all of the erosion is aeolian. So basically, the wind just carves away at the rock and hopefully leaves fossils right there on the surface for you to be able to find. I think it's probably very, very similar to this. I guess we'll see as we continue. But yeah, just sandblasted Wombat Hole. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And Spinonicus Art, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. And Walking Whales, I need to look this one up. Oh yeah, Digital Deck. Oh yeah. There's a number of different Walking Whales. The most well-known of which is probably good old Ambulocetus, whose name literally means Walking Whale. Yeah, um, I'm sure this is going to cover that too. So let's uh, let's get into it. I'm doing well, Spinonicus. Art, thanks for asking. Yeah. And Barnacle Bum. Think of Egypt. When uh, when the the wind is is doing its erosional thing like that. Uh, it erodes the, hopefully it erodes the sediment faster than it erodes the actual fossils. So eventually the fossils, once they're left out, they will erode away. But that's not as quickly as the surrounding matrix gets eroded away. 
Does that make sense? The fossils are a little bit tougher than the surrounding matrix. Like ancient Egyptian civilization, like pharaohs, Sphinx, and Romans even. But what I'm studying is way beyond this time. Prehistoric life. Let's watch this last night. Cool, play phony. Nice. Salam is on a mission to uncover his country's prehistoric past. Yeah. The place that we are heading toward is one of the most important place in Egypt, if not in the world, in terms of paleontology. Very cool. Hisham is searching for clues to an extraordinary evolutionary mystery. And I'm pretty sure uh, Hisham Salam is uh, is the advisor or, or boss or, or, you know, lead investigator in the laboratory of uh, a friend of mine, Bilal Salem, who came out to dig with us, not this past summer, but in the summer of 2022, he came out to uh, to eastern Utah to dig with us. Yeah, yeah. He might even show up on this. We'll have to see. Here it's uh, the middle of nowhere. It seems like empty place, but there is tons of evidence that you can see. Fossils are everywhere, telling you what life looked like 40 million years ago. And look at the silhouette on his shirt, too, right there. Um, this... And it's the same critter that I have right here in this illustration. Bobby Bosenecker did that painting right there. Yeah. Paleontologists discover a four-legged whale fossil. Name it Phyomycetus Anubis, after Egypt's god of death. Yeah. Bobby Bosenecker did this wonderful illustration here. Uh, pretty, pretty cool. And it is bearing down on a poor sawfish right there. Uh, just gonna eat it up. Yeah, which is why we've got a sawfish rostrum in the background today. See? It all comes together. t Matt Trick says whales don't have legs. They did. Some of them still do. Some whales occasionally are born with vestigial legs. That's like a holdover from when whales walked. A, a holdover from when, uh, when whales actually lived on land. Evolving from creatures like this, Pachycetus. Yeah, and yeah, Bobby did just move back to California. Never winter. I might uh, might see if I can meet up with him sometime soon. Him and, and Sarah Bosnecker, kind of a paleontology power couple. Yeah, pretty cool. So each one of these critters we've got pretty decent fossils of, including Cuchicetus. And TMK says, is the legs only inside the body, or is it fin- Well, the front legs have become flippers, but some whales still have remnants of their their pelvic girdle, and sometimes I think even their hind limbs, embedded in their flesh and the rear part of their body. This guy Dorudon has still got tiny little, little wimpy hind legs right there. If you look closely, you can see him in this animation. Um, but some whales are still born with tiny little legs like that, too. It's like what we call an atavistic trait. It's kind of like when a human is born with a tail. Um, yeah, same idea. Whale with vestigial legs. Uh, let's try whale born with vestigial legs. Um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there's a dolphin with vestigial legs. There you go. Yeah. So it does still happen sometimes. It's not common, but it does happen. 
Yeah. And then some whales like this bowhead whale, they still have remnants of their hind limbs in, uh, in their skeleton there. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. And how do you write that? The fact that some whales were born with remnant legs? Um, we call that an atavistic trait? Or something like that? Yeah. And, uh, it's really troubling to me that, like, a lot of the top results in here are from creationist websites. Like this, Institute, Institute for Creation Research. I think this is probably a creationist website as well. Um... Answers in Genesis right here. Like, creationists are really, really threatened by this idea, which is... Makes a lot of sense, actually. You know? This is it. This is the horizon which marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Geo Jim. Below this level, and out in welcome, here, welcome. are dinosaur fossils. It's good to have you here. Above this level, on these rocks, there are no dinosaur fossils. So I'm actually standing on the level that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Thank you, thank you, Geo Jim. 2006 and their nine graders have stumbled below that level. <laughs> Let's talk dinosaurs. Geo Jim, how did your stream go? I hope it was really good. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is great to have you here. Up oh, and Mini Pie has returned. Hello, Mini Pie. Hi. How are you doing? Well, she is quite keen on the attention today, aren't you, Mini Pie? Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Geo Jim says hello, Paleo friends, and hello to you, Geo Jim. I hope you're doing well. It's good to see you. Uh. Yeah, tell me how your stream went. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. What were you discussing? Tell me, tell me. And Mini Pie does have hind flippers. Well, hind legs. She's got fully formed hind legs back here. Jar, jar, jar. Get those legs. Get those legs. Get those legs. Oh, get them, get them, get them, get them, get them. Get them, get them, get them. <laughs> oh. uh, sorting invertebrate fossils. But I had a few baleen whale bones in the mix. Oh, that is super cool, Geo Jim. So looking at some uh, some Cenozoic uh, matrix there. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Oh, what do you think? Well, well, you are a Cenozoic mammal yourself, aren't you, Mini Pie? Yeah. Well, I am too. Get you a treat. I'll get you another treat. Let's do that. Oh, you know that sound. It's spring into action. Oh, oh, oh. A desk panther. There you go, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah. You know, panther is a generic term, not a genus name, but like it's a term for multiple big cats. A panther could be Puma Concolor. A mountain lion. It could be a leopard. It could be a jaguar. Um, I've also heard melanistic tigers called panthers before. Um, yeah. So could a domestic cat be a black panther? What do you think, Minnie? Are you a black panther? Are you a black panther? Yeah, Minnie Panther. There you go, Barnacle Bum. Yeah. Yeah. Love me, but don't you dare. Exactly, Rekodactylus. You know what you need, Mini Pie? You need some brushing right now. You got you got hair flying everywhere. Let's let's take care of some of that, shall we? Can I brush you? Will you let me? Will you permit me? Will you do me the honor? There you go. Good stuff. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Oh, no, I 
I'll tell you another. Oh. About 250. Well, well, well. Jedi Mega Man, thank you, thank you. For the 16 months of support. I hear uh -huh. many streamers with partner plus have enough power to survive owning a panther as a pet. <laughs> there you go, Jedi Mega Man. Yeah, yeah. Many pie. She's got to be at least, you know, four or five hundred pounds. Um, thank you for helping me get to partner plus there, Jedi Mega Man. Those 16 months of support. It means a lot to me. It does. Look at all that excess fur we're getting. Yeah. Funny, all the preemptive brushing I do right now might cut down on the amount of vacuuming I have to do later. Oh, many. Yeah. And G Cube says if eyes on the side of the head is more likely prey, are dinosaurs and birds the exception? Uh, there's way more exceptions than that. I don't know. Anytime somebody makes like a, a broad generalization, they're like, "Oh, creatures with their eyes in front are always predators." It's not like that can be kind of a a general rule, but it doesn't really work most of the time. I don't know. It, it depends more on, like, who your ancestors are. And, like, forward-facing eyes kind of are a hallmark of predators in some cases, but there's many more exceptions than there are, I think, instances that actually fit that rule. Think about creatures like squid. You know? Squid are voracious predators. They've got eyes on the sides of their heads. Creatures like pandas are, uh, not exactly predators. And they've got forward-facing eyes. Because they evolved from a bear ancestor that, you know, was maybe a little bit more predatory. But most bears, even themselves, are they're only part-time predators. So the, the natural world is much more squishy and, and you know, it doesn't really like to play by the rules that we try and set for it. The neat little boxes that we try and put it into it just doesn't really work most of the time. That makes sense? Yeah, creatures like Allosaurus were consummate predators. And they had eyes on the sides of their heads. They probably didn't have excellent depth perception, but these are like some of the biggest, fiercest predators around in the late Jurassic. Like Allosaurus, not a creature you'd want to run into in a dark alley. Um, but they had eyes on the sides. So, as a general rule, it just doesn't really work. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so not really real? Exactly. Yeah, nature doesn't care about that. Exactly, Delta Rain. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people like simple, neat categories and rules. Exactly, Delta. In the same way that people go, like, you know, well, whale whales don't have legs. Well, they used to, and sometimes they still do. Um, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, again, here is a... Well, I can only find small versions of that. Anyway. Yeah. Um, anyway, whales used to have legs. Let's get back to whales, shall we? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, nature is, has no obligation to have joint. There you go, Rigodactylus. Yes, agreed. Telling you what life looked like forty million years ago. Yeah. Across more than seventy-five square miles, fossils litter the desert. There are so many. Hisham has to remove his shoes to avoid crushing them. This is in a lot of paleontological Look quarries. This, for example, you do that. Just be careful. A really nice shell. Really wonderful. Well preserved. Look at that. It's look like living one, but it was living 40 million years ago. Very cool. 
But this desert also hides much larger fossils. This is typically what you see in Wadi Hitan. The bone is sticking out from the cliff, ah. calling you to come and see it. And uh, <laughs> indeed, this is a really huge animal. The vertebra would be that Bear big. Space. It's okay, you can and wash your socks. Not only the vertebra, <laughs> but also Rinse you can find ribs all no over the place. Reganation giving the, the size one of the vertebra. Reganation? Might be thank you, thank you. I appreciate that, Reganation. 20 meter long. In the Holy cow, Reganation. The size and shape of and an animal around 60 feet long, encased in this rock, has... I tried to, I tried to pause that right there, and it didn't work, because the cursor wasn't in the right place. Um, How big is this fossil whale? Given the size of the vertebrae, it might be getting up to 20 meter long. That's longer than a bus. That's impressive. The size and shape of an animal around 60 feet long, encased yeah. in this rock, has led scientists to a remarkable conclusion. I think we have a complete skeleton of the prehistoric whale that lived here in Egypt long, long, long time ago. Pretty cool. Since the first whale fossils were rope. discovered yeah, in 1902, <laughs> experts have found around 1,000 individuals. Wow. Wow, 1,000 individual whales. This is the ancient whale graveyard known on Earth. Incredible. That's why paleontologists named it Wadi Hitan, the Valley of the Whales. Yeah. But what are these sea creatures doing here? In a desert over a hundred miles from the coast. Well, it didn't used to be a desert. And I, I love the uniform here, Shuruk these t-shirts. is one of Egypt's first female vertebrate paleontologists. Yeah. These are shark teeth. Also, look at these shells. These animals live at the bottom of the sea. Nearby, Sharuk finds another clue. Look at the Let's see. Sweet and Sauerkraut says all deserts were once oceans. Uh, not all deserts. A lot of them used to be, but, you know, uh, the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, I don't know if that's ever been underwater in the, the history of, of our planet. I don't know if, if you know, uh, that part of East Asia was ever underwater. Um, so it's not true in all cases, but in, in this case, it is true. This was once at the bottom of the sea. This structure. Yeah. Many scientists do believe that these are mangroves. Something you heard? Yeah. You know, and, and I, I appreciate you saying that. Like, it's, again, this is, this is the beauty of Twitch. We can have these live interactions like this and like, no, I can think of an exception to that. The Gobi Desert was never underwater. Jandria Loon says the Atacama Desert wasn't. Yeah, probably too high up. The Atacama is like a high altitude desert, if I recall. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and Antarctica is an ice desert. There you go. Well, much of Antarctica is currently underwater. The water just happens to be frozen. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of mangrove seeds all over the area, but other scientists believe that this might be crustacean burrows. They Crabs, do kind of look like crustacean burrows. Yeah. Lived there and burrowed in the soft sand. Invertebrate burrows. <laughs> Whether these are fossilized mangrove roots or burrows dug by prehistoric crustaceans, I feel like that would be easy to test. It's clear this area was once underwater. I mean, I if Geo Jim is still here, I wonder if uh, if he would have any insight into this. Being able to test whether these are fossil mangrove roots or whether these are fossil burrows. Burrow, you know, burrows like holes in the ground dug by animals, not like fossil burros, not fossil donkeys. Um, calcium versus carbon content level, perhaps maybe procyon. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Anyway, interesting. Clear, this area was once underwater. 
Today's excavation site. And Paleo Stream says there's been some back and forth on this. Newer papers propose these to be bros. Interesting, Paleo Stream. Interesting. Very cool. I'd love to get uh, Tony Martin's perspective on this. We'll hopefully be interviewing him soon, but Tony Martin works on, you know, he's a paleoichnologist, works on fossil traces, and burrows are one of his, uh, one of his favorite things. Yeah, I'd love to know what he would think about that. They don't really look that much like mangrove roots to me, but who cares what I think? I'm not an expert in this, you know? Yeah. Today's excavation not sure if they look site like was at the to me, bottom of the sea Thanks, Jojo. Cool. million years ago. Cool. Yeah, oh, this is important. So, today, 40 million years ago. Today, 40 million years ago. So Africa has been moving north like this. Um, but also, sea levels were a lot higher back then. Yeah. Pretty cool. Today's excavation site was at the bottom of the sea 40 million years ago. Yeah. Back then, the Mediterranean was part of a much larger ocean, the Tethys. Yeah, the Tethys Sea. It stretched from Europe. I always thought that was a beautiful name, Tethys. Be a beautiful name for a, for a baby girl, Tethys. T-E-T-H-Y-S. Yeah. And uh, hang on a second here. That right there. There we go. Uh, uh, let's continue. Back then, the Mediterranean was part of a much larger ocean, the Tethys. It stretched from Europe to India and was full of marine life. But when sea levels dropped, they left behind a seabed rich in fossils. Very cool. Today, this desert is the resting place of some of the earliest whales ever found. They may hold the Thank key you, Claire, to how today's ocean you, giants evolved. Panthalassa, also a cool name. Not not quite as hippie as Tethys, but yeah. yeah. 6,000 miles away in the Dominican Republic, living whales gather in these tropical waters early in the year. Nice. It's humpback whale breeding season. Comparative anatomist Joy Reidenberg has come to study them. Oh, there's a blow. Wow. Oh, and just the other <laughs> side. Did you see that? There's this tiny little fin. That's the baby. <laughs> Ah, ah, very cool. By the way, can we get some paleo salutes in the chat for our moderators, especially especially Claire right there, and uh, and Delta. Um, thank you, thank you, mods for uh for helping take care of that. I appreciate it very much. Big paleo salute to our uh, our hardworking moderators here. Good stuff. Good stuff. Here. Wow. Oh, and just the other side. Did you see that? There's this tiny little fin. That's the baby. We've got a mother and her calf right here together, swimming side by side. Humpbacks are one of around 90 different species of whale living today that include toothed whales like orcas, dolphins, yeah. and porpoises. What we call odontocetes. Whales like these humpbacks. What we call mysticetes. And so this two group, these two groups of whales, I'm not sure when they diverged exactly, but they've been separate for a good while now. The only echolocating whales are the odontocetes. And let me show you them on our tree of life. So let's go to Cetacea right here. The whales. Uh, seen a humpback up close on a whale watch in high school. That's super cool, Regination. Came right up to the boat. Very cool. I've never been that close to a live whale in the wild um but yeah whales dolphins and porpoises 83 species according to this count here but there's a split um i guess yeah about 28 29 million years ago the great whales aka mysticetes the baleen whales are here 
There's 13 species of them. And you get the toothed whales, the odonto seeds. 70 species. And, oh, actually, no, shoot. Further ago than that, I guess 42 million years ago, this group diverged. You'd think the divergence points would be the same for both of those. That's a little odd, but okay. Huh. Uh, thank you again, Claire. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Um, your, your hard work moderating there. Appreciate you, Claire. I do. Uh, Charlie's Dragon says, I've touched the only taxidermied blue whale in the world. Does that count for anything? Sure. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You know, I was uh, lucky enough to encounter a preserved whale skeleton. Um, I'm looking for that right now. Let's see, would that have been like spring of 2023? I think it was. Let's see. But it was it was pretty big. It was pretty big. Uh there we go. Actually that's a different whale. This is like a it's not a minky whale. Who is this? I was really trying to photograph the bird there. I think Lordy might have photos of me in front of the whale skeleton. But, yeah, here's the blue whale skeleton right here. And again, I was trying to photograph that bird for Thursday Bird's Day. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Also, hey, um, Team at Tricks, can you just kind of cool it with the anti-religion stuff, please? I don't want to have to time you out. Just be chill, okay? I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me find you uh, maybe a video of this. That was, let's see. Santa Cruz. Whale skeleton. Yeah. Wait, what? They're taking it down? For over two decades, this 87 foot long blue whale skeleton, known as Miss Blue, has been a fixture outside the Seymour Marine Discovery Center in Santa yeah. Cruz. We do believe that Miss Blue, if not the longest, is one of the longest blue whale skeletons on display outdoors in the world. But now this heavy specimen has to come down. So we're actually concerned about the, the specimen falling. This is a really harsh coastal climate, and some of the corrosion and some uh, of the rusting on metal out here is inevitable. Upon yeah. hearing the news, a crowd assembled, many for one last visit. Some traveled from out of town. Welcome home, Miss Blue. Welcome home to you. Welcome home to the shores of old Santa Cruz. Welcome home to This song was written back in 2004 and sang every year during the holiday season. Hmm. Uh, so during the holiday season, um, They actually put Christmas lights all over the whale skeleton, which I think is super, super, super cool. Um, that's one of the coolest things, isn't it? Yeah. They should have that up all year. I mean, yeah, but then it, you can see them during the daytime as well. And it's just, yeah. I, th I think it's a really cool holiday tradition, a really cool winter tradition. There. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just think it's cool they do that at all. You know, very cool. That's what whales look like in space. Trust. This <laughs> is red sledge. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thordal. I like that. Let's approve that. Oh. <laughs> Last whaleness. I gave you my bones. Yeah. Uh, it's like a regular whale skeleton, but extra. I know, right, Lordy? Isn't that great? That's super cool. Um, yeah. Welcome home to 
This song hey, Sparky Pugrash. Welcome, welcome. And sing every year during the holiday season. Your turn now. Welcome so are they gonna are they gonna put it back up after they take it down? Landmark, captured in family photos, weddings, field trips, and oh. millions of fascinated eyes. We used to come out here as kids for a class trip, so we just wanted to come say goodbye to the whale. The whale was first discovered in 1979 when washed ashore on Pescadero Beach. It was recovered by a group of UC Santa Cruz students, some of whom were in attendance. Oh well, you know, wow. as a young biology student, it was an amazing. Um, Thing to be involved in, you know, the largest mammal or largest animal ever on earth. In a few weeks, Miss Blue will be disassembled, but it's not leaving. The bones will be laid out on the ground as the Seymour Center brainstorms what's next. Some ideas include raising it back up or putting in a replica. With all those options huh. come a variety of price points. So, I mean, the highest option could be a two, three, three million dollar project. And so, we need to hear from the community if this is of interest. Wow. Do we think we could really raise the well, hello, hello, sweetie pie. Well, we have cat number two here right now. Sweetie pie, how are you doing? Yeah. How are you doing? Good to see you, sweetie. Well, landlord two of three here. Yeah, cat, no more whales. No more whales. Only cat. Only cat, no more whale. <laughs> oh, sweetie. The cats love sniffing this wall right here, and I think it's because they can smell the outside. This is not well insulated. It just goes, like, outside right there. Yeah, what do you think? What do you smell out there? Yeah. Can I... Can I interest you in a treat, sweetie pie? Um, compliments of the chef. Would you like one of these? What do you think? Oh. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Good stuff. Yeah. How is that, sweetie pie? Can I get you another one? Can I get you another one? Wait some seconds. Good girl, sweetie. He's like, oh, the treats have been depleted. Exit stage left. One track mind sometimes, that sweetie pie. Actually, a lot of the times. But yeah, hey, let's. Let's come a variety here. of price points. So, I mean, the highest option could be a two, three, three million dollar project. And so we need to hear from the community if this is of interest. Do we think we could really raise the two or three million dollars to do something that that complicated? What are you talking about? This is California. Of course, we can raise two or three million dollars. That's that's chump change when you have people like, um, uh, Elmo Zuckerberg and and um, Jeff Muskion and people like that here. You know, that's like one kick. Exactly, Reagan Nation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That complex and that beautiful. In Santa Cruz, Christian Balderas, KSBW, Action News 8. Memorable song there, too. The Seymour Center will use virtual reality to bring the whale back to life. Soon people can visit the site and with virtual reality use a phone to see the whale reassembled and swimming. Very cool. Bill and Co are busy with tech. Well, yeah, that's... It's par for the course with billionaires. Um, it's often how they became billionaires. 
cheating the system. Um. Anyway, you know who doesn't cheat the system? Well, they, they kind of do in terms of being marine. They don't have to worry about supporting their weight on land. But, you know, we let it slide because they're whales. Everybody loves whales. Let's get back to them. Today, that include toothed whales like orcas, dolphins, and porpoises. Yeah, the odonto seats. Lean whales like these humpbacks. The mysticetes, like I showed you. Whales can swim thousands of miles, dive thousands of feet, and stay underwater for over an hour. Wow. I love whales. I really do. Such magnificent, huge creatures, and so well adapted for being in the water. <laughs> and yet they're mammals. Yeah. They breathe air using lungs. Just like us. They feed their young with milk. They give birth to live young. They've got, got mother and calf over here. The mother is specialized mammal ear bones. But these animals not so well adapted. <laughs> they got red sledge. <laughs> An extra thick milk, exactly, cast the dreamer. Whale milk. Uh the milk of baleen whales, mysticete whales, is so thick that like you'd have to chew it. It's like cream cheese, basically. Yeah. Not only breathe air and give milk, but they're doing everything mammals do, but in the water. They yeah. have to mate in the water. They have to carry their pregnancy in the water. They have to find food in the water, and then they give birth. And pro science is, I knew whales were mammals, but I always kind of thought of them using gills. Yeah, they don't. And actually, you might think that that's a big disadvantage for a creature that lives in the water to breathe air. But, you know, I was talking with another paleontologist about this not too long ago, and they're, they were like, no, that's not, that's not a disadvantage at all. Being an air-breathing animal that lives underwater actually gives you a huge advantage. Because gills can only be so efficient. You can only get a little bit of oxygen through your gills from the water at a time. It's not like you can, you can just take a big gulp of air. If you can swim to the surface and take a big gulp of air, suddenly you can oxygenate your whole body, like all the cells in your body, using that big gulp of air. You can be a lot more active. You can have more stamina. You can fire your muscles with greater rapidity and greater strenuousness than you can if you're just, like... You know, it's the difference between, like, breathing normally and, like, breathing through a little drinking straw. Does that make sense? Yeah, and... It, I don't know, that made perfect sense to me when I first heard that. Um, but yeah, yeah... And you can jump out of the water for fun. Exactly, Tolkien, yeah. Yeah. Uh, whales are amazing because they're not fish with gills, etc. Then he comes and goes, well, whales are fish like every other mammal. Yeah, all tetrapods are fish. It is true. Whales aren't fish, but they also are. Well, whales aren't... They're not ray-finned fish. But they are lobefin fish. Let's let's talk about that for a minute. So let's go to our vertebrates on our tree of life here. Yeah. Oh, and Paleo Stream says you can see that in many fish. The way the larger they get, the larger their gills have to be. Look at basking sharks. Yeah, Paleo Stream. That's true. Yeah, because you need more surface area. It's probably a uh, Probably has to do with, like, the inverse square law, right? Or square cube law? I don't know. I'm not a physicist. Um, but yeah, vertebrate animals. Animals that have backbones. All uh, right, here. You could make the argument that all of these are fish. Because the first vertebrates to evolve, the jawed vertebrates, nathostomes. Uh, from there, you have the ray-finned fishes that evolved, and the lobe-finned fishes, including tetrapods. So, whales are fish. They're lobe-finned fish. So are birds. And frogs are fish. Lemurs are fish. Lizards are fish. Snakes are fish. Possums are fish. I'm a fish. You're a fish. It's because all of these creatures evolved from fishy ancestors that lived in the water. I haven't finished painting my Tiktaalik model, or else I would pull that out right now. But all of the land-living vertebrate animals, 
All mammals, all reptiles, all amphibians evolved from an animal that looked a lot like this. It came up out of the water. So that's our ancestor, yeah. Or this is close to our ancestor, at least. Tiktaalik, we don't know if that's the direct ancestor of vertebrates. Chances are it's not, because the, the odds that we found the exact ancestor of all the tetrapods is pretty slim. But it's not impossible. But yeah, pretty cool. Tiktaalik. Uh, and again, what is it with Google Images and having all these creationist websites here at the top? Ugh. But yeah. Anyway. From a fishy ancestor like this, you had all of the reptiles, all the mammals, and the amphibians that evolved from it. And whales evolved from, you know, a mammal that is descended from a critter like this. So, strictly speaking, whales are fish. Basically, all vertebrate animals are fish. And Barnacle Bum says, I'm a barnacle. You might be, but everybody else is probably a mammal here. Barnacles are kind of crustacean. Were you aware of that, Barnacle Bump? Yeah. And uh, Octo says, I would argue that you are what you are rather than you are what you evolved from. That's not how classification works, though. Yeah. Ontogeny. Mama Bonbon. Bon. Thank you, thank you for the 32 months of support. I really appreciate that. I really do. Thank you, thank you for keeping me online for the past 32 months. Holy cow. Here, let's let's talk a little bit about taxonomy. Um let's see. Check this out. There's Lovely video story here. about beavers? Uh, in the 1700s, a Canadian bishop asked the Catholic Church if it was okay to eat beaver during Lent, a period of time when Catholics abstain from eating meat. But eating fish was okay. And look, beavers spend so much time in the water that they should totally count. And remarkably, the Church agreed. Beavers, at least as far as it mattered during Lent, were fish. Yeah. True story. And humanity, oh, the humanity, thank you for the follow. Welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Well, in most cases, people would probably say that beavers obviously should not count as fish. They have fur and live babies and breathe air, for instance. As for what science says, oh boy. Ah, uh, see, the thing is, the answer is surprisingly complicated because beavers yeah. are not fish, but that might be because either we're all fish or fish kind of don't exist. Not that, uh, oh, like, that wording there rankles me a little bit. Fish don't exist. Of course fish exist, but that term f fish, from a certain point of view, isn't very meaningful if all vertebrate animals are fish. If fish is essentially equivalent to vertebrate, it's not that fish don't exist, it's that the term itself is not very informative. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the end, this is going to be a story about different ways of grouping animals together, why we use language the way that we do, and how evolution has made things kind of funny. For a long time, people grouped yeah. animals together by some common body plan or lifestyle. And this is probably the way that you learned about classification in school. Um, especially if you're here in the in the United States, if you learned about biological classification, this is probably like the extent of it. You know, these different categories like this, and like, oh, fish are different from reptiles, which are different from birds. The truth is, birds evolved from dinosaurs, which are a kind of reptile, and reptiles evolved from fishy ancestors. So birds are actually a kind of reptile, and reptiles are a kind of fish. Therefore, birds are a kind of fish. Does that make sense? In in science, we cla we classify living things based on what they evolved from, what their ancestry is. You know, it's not in order to actually like create meaningful classification that actually reflects the natural world. We have to figure out 
which creatures are actually more closely related to which other creatures in a real in a real sense and basically we have to create like a family tree and that's how this works yeah and uh, Goodwill Smith says everything is fish well if you're a vertebrate animal an animal with bones you are a fish yeah so that, does, that doesn't work for invertebrates. You know, lobsters are not fish. Insects are not fish. Octopus are not fish. That's funny. Shellfish are not, are not actually fish. Because they didn't evolve from a fish ancestor. They're from a different branch on the tree of life. So rather than being from the bony vertebrates group, or jawed vertebrates, there we go. That also includes chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish. Um, you get other creatures, like over these, uh, over here, over these guys, tunicates, sea squirts are not fish, lancelets are not fish, starfish are not fish, because they didn't evolve from a fish ancestor. Does that make sense? Yeah. And ditto jellyfish, there you go, chilata, yeah. Jellyfish aren't fish either. Yeah. And I'm a fish, but I identify as a mammal. That's perfectly fine. Um, uh, Magnetar, what a great name, by the way. It took me a minute to figure that out, Magnetar. But yeah, yeah. You are a mammal. And you're also a fish. Because all mammals are also fish. Does that make sense? So in the end, whales are fish too. Yes, La Petite Prince. Yes. Yeah. I'm a fish subtype mammal. There you go, Rekodactylus, yeah. Yeah. Um, and guinea pigs are, in fact, not porcine. I know they're rodents, reanimated, but yeah. 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 Anyway, and we had another new chatter here, too. Who is that? Oh, Goodwill Smith and Magnetar. Welcome, both of you, to, uh, to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. We're talking about fossil whales today, and as I predicted, it's taken... It might, it might take us a while to get through this documentary here. It's only uh, 53 minutes long, but, well, live broadcast, all this commentary, it's going to take a good while longer than that. Anyway. Yeah. And Le Petit Dinosaurs were the sort of creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet. It's true, Mecca. The kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. Or a wonderful dream. I wish you well. I wish you well as well, Mechaholic. It's good to have you here. Thank you for the 30 months of support. That's almost a whole year, isn't it? <laughs> Mechaholic, I really appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, Le Petit says, So great fun now to have a discussion with teachers. I'm glad you think so. Yeah. And... Beard says the whale shark is one of the worst named creatures in terms of causing confusion. Yeah, I've heard people say there was there was a an awful TV like an awful reality show that I was watching with Ios and Lordy a while ago, and um, let's see, let me see if I can find this. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it here. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, never mind. I'm not going to name the title of the show. But uh, it was like this, you know, sensationalistic, scuzzy reality show. And it was set in Mexico. And then for one of the activities, they went out to go see some whale sharks. And whale sharks are these wonderful filter-feeding chondrichthian fishes. So they are, they're actually the world's largest um, cartilaginous fish. So they are a kind of shark, but they are called whale sharks. Um, Rinkadon? Is that the is that the genus name for these guys? Um, 
But there was a guy on the boat that they, uh, that like does the whale shark tours, and he's supposed to be like the whale shark expert. And they had him on the, on the show. And he says to the camera, like, you know, whale sharks are really special because they're not actually whales and they're not actually sharks. And I practically screamed at the TV. Like, no, they are sharks. They are sharks. Whale sharks are a kind of shark. Uh, yeah. So they're from the same family as zebra sharks and short-tailed nurse sharks. They are sharks. They're 1,000% sharks. Um, they're here within this group called the Carpet Sharks. Arectobliformes. Interesting. I didn't know that. So, anyway. Yeah. But they are indeed sharks which are cartilaginous fishes, right here. Chondrichthys is the clade name. Uh, never trust a guy in Speedos ever. There you go, Kill Nuke. Yeah, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, uh, Reiko says, Carpet Sharks would be a fun name for an alt-rock band. I agree. And Carpet Sharks are not carpets. That's true, Diagonal. Yeah. Yeah, so they're... <laughs> anyway, vertebrate animals, basically, you know, they are fish. Let's, let's get back to... Let's get back to this video here. The funny. For a lot, we yeah. use language the way that we do, and how evolution has made things kind of funny. For a long time, people grouped animals together by some common body plan or lifestyle, like fish, reptile, or bird. This is good because it means we can talk about many different organisms at once without needing to name each one individually. This lets us yeah. make useful general statements, like it's fish tacos for lunch today. And this is generally how science worked, too. But over the years, as we learned more about evolution, it became clear that this old way of talking wouldn't work as well. There were too many exceptions, yep. too many groups what of a great things video that here. seemed similar but weren't when you looked under the hood. Instead, we developed a new, more scientific way of grouping animals together called cladistics. In this approach, we sort living things into groups, or clades, that reflect their evolutionary history and how closely related they are. There's a couple of different yep. ways to do this precisely, but a good example might be to say that rather than trying to define prime by things like opposable thumbs or big brains. Instead, we would say the group of animals known as primates includes all species that are descended from the most recent common ancestor of humans, apes, and lemurs. That's a yeah. bit of a mouthful, but defining things this way is actually really useful for biologists. It gives us a way to make predictions, for instance. Like if two different species are grouped very closely together, we can predict that their genomes must be relatively similar. And that's really, really important in science. In science, uh, an idea is not useful or it's not really worth anything unless it makes testable predictions. It's one of the, the most important things in science is for an idea to make testable predictions. And that's what cladistics allows us to do. This runs into funny situations, though. Like, again, the question of whether beavers should count as fish. Let's take, for example, the evolutionary history of a very definitely a fish fish, like a goldfish. Its early yeah. ancestors were some of the first vertebrates. Unlike their close, more worm-like cousins, lancelets, they had a yep. backbone, which let them swim more powerfully. As time went on, this group split. Some, which would become the ancestors of hagfish and lamprey, stayed roughly how they were. But yeah, so the lamprey and hagfish are jawless vertebrates right here. Uh, cyclostomata, so these are some of the quote-unquote most primitive of vertebrate animals. There's our hagfishes and our lampreys right there. Yeah. But the group that led to goldfish would go on to develop powerful jaws. Over time, more groups split off as more characteristics evolved. Sharks and rays split off while the goldfish's ancestors got bony skeletons. And let me show you that right here. So, we've got our jawed vertebrates. And then, first to split off right there are our chondrichthian fishes. Cartilaginous fishes right there. Yeah. And lol, whatever, dog. Hey, welcome to Paleontologizer. Well, it's never been to Egypt. Um, I'd love to go someday, though. Holy cow. All kinds of really, really cool whale fossils. Anyway, we're going to get back to whale fossils in a little bit. But right now, 
We're talking about phylogeny. We're talking about how we classify living things. In another split, lobe-finned fishes diverged. These are the yeah. ancestors of fish with thick, fleshy, paired fins for... Yep, yep, yep. And those guys are right here. We've got our bony vertebrates, vertebrates with bony skeletons, or ray-finned fishes, split off there. And then we get our lobe-finned fishes right here. This is a group that includes us. And it includes whales and birds and frogs and lemurs and etc. Uh, and dinosaurs, too. Dinosaurs are lobe-finned fishes. We are lobe-finned fishes. Sweetie Pie the cat is a lobe-finned fish. Vertebrate animals that live on land evolved from lobe-finned fishes. They are part of clade Sarcopterygii. And coelacanths, yes, indeed, Sparky Bugwash. Yes, indeed. Her limbs, coelacanths, like coelacanths right and lungfish. Meanwhile, yeah. our goldfish's ancestors went on to develop fins made of bony spines connected by skin. Eventually, yeah. we arrive at today and the familiar goldfish. So far, so good. And everything we mentioned so far would be in the category of what most people would call a fish. But it turns out, the beaver's evolutionary story is largely the same. Beavers yep. share the same vertebrate ancestor as goldfish, and their ancestors also watched hagfish and sharks split off. And as lobed fin fish split off, some of them, a group called tetrapods, used their fleshy limbs to haul themselves onto land. And that was these critters like we were talking about before. Was it, uh, yeah. Tiktaalik right here is a wonderful example of a lobe fin fish. Look at those fleshy lobe fins. This critter would haul itself up onto, uh, uh, onto the shore and, you know, do its fishy thing up there. Pretty cool to think about, right? This is... A really, really cool critter. This is a lobe-finned fish, and it's from lobe-finned fishes like this that mammals like beavers and like us and like cats and bats and rats and whales all evolved. So yeah, so strictly speaking, whales are fish, as are all mammals. Eventually giving rise to early mammals and eventually to our beaver friends. And of course we humans are in there too, in the tetrapod group, along with every other tetrapod, like frogs and alligators, snakes, birds and horses. If you zoom out, yep. the tetrapod branch is just one nestled among a bunch of different fishy clay. Does that make sense? Does this make sense? This is why whales are fish. So are lizards and camels and gibbons, and deer, they're all fish. Tetrapods, bony animals, animals with bony skeletons that got, that got limbs, even some that lost their limbs, like snakes. They're still tetrapods. They are fish. We're fish in that sense. Does this, are, are, are you tracking right now? You picking up what I'm putting down? Please. Yeah. So back to the question. Are beavers fish? Remember that in the cladistic approach, for a definition to be useful, we want to include everything that is descended from a common ancestor so that we can make predictions about who is related to whom on an evolutionary scale. And that is really, really important to understand. So here. Um, talking about a clade versus a grade. Um, Yeah. Let's see here. I'm trying to find you the best. I guess this one will work. Yeah. Evolutionary grade versus clade. So, oh boy. This is an SVG image? It is. That's why it's all wonky like this. Anyway, this right here in red is a clade. This includes the ancestor and each of its descendants. So this is a clade. This one in green chat, is this one a proper clade that includes the ancestor and all of its descendants? What do you think? In green here, is this a clade or is it not? What do you think? Let me know. Well, if you answered no, 
You're correct. This is not a clade. Yeah, because it excludes the stuff in blue that evolved from this ancestor right here. In order to be a clade, like a true evolutionary group, an actual like group, it has to include the, the ancestor and all of its descendants. And right here in green, you've got these descendants over here in blue that evolved from this ancestor here. The same ancestor that these two know that these two evolved from. Trace that down here. It's excluding these, so green is not a clade. This would be kind of like fish right here. This is why, like, fish in the in the common parlance, like when you go to the store and you, you know, you ask, oh yeah, where do I where do I find the fish? They're probably not gonna direct you to the area with uh I don't know, the frozen chickens or cow legs or sheep heads or whatever people buy at the butcher. I don't know. I don't eat meat. Um, this is the like common understanding of the word fish. Word includes bony fishes and a few lobe fin fishes, like maybe coelacanths and, and lungfish. If people who don't understand this naming, don't understand this schema, or if they're aware of lungfish and coelacanths, which they're probably not. Um, <laughs> but it excludes all the tetrapods? That's not a proper clade, you know? In order to make fish a clade, you have to include the tetrapods. You have to include the mammals and the reptiles and the amphibians. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, where are the fish? You're talking to one right now. There you go, <laughs> B-R-O. Yeah, yeah. Um, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah. You don't eat meat, you eat fish. I don't eat fish either. <laughs> Magnets are, yeah. So that we can make predictions about who is related to whom on an evolutionary scale. Yeah, and what is a clade again? Let me show you. Uh, le petit, let me show ya. So let's go here on good old Wikipedia. This will be a pretty decent explanation. A clade. Also known as a monophyletic group or natural group, is a grouping of organisms that are monophyletic. That is, they're composed of a common ancestor and all of its lineal descendants. I'll link this for you there in the chat. Yeah. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Let's finish this video out, shall we? There we go. So this means that if we want to be able to say that sharks, hagfish, and goldfish are all fish, we kind of have three options. One, animals like humans and beavers are fish. Two, you have to carve out some ridiculous definition, like fish would be any organism that is descended from the most recent common ancestor of both hagfish and goldfish, except for the subset of that group that is descended from the most recent common ancestor of frogs and beavers. So yeah. This kind of works, except it's way too long, and it's also incredibly arbitrary. It's like, yeah, we're just going to arbitrarily exclude tetrapods while including other descendants of this group. Does that make sense? So this is why we are fish. And it's because if we're not, you got to do this crazy, crazy, like, mental gymnastics here in order to arbitrarily exclude certain groups of descendants. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you have to cut more than once, it's not a clade. I like that diagonal. I like that a lot. In fact, actually, I believe we have that right here in this diagram. Yeah, so this, you know, diagonal, that's beautiful, actually. I've never heard it put that way, but it makes intuitive sense. Here, you can, you can just snip off that branch, and that is a clade. It's got the ancestor and all the descendants, and you can just... There you go. It's a clade. Right here, this is a clade because it's the ancestor and all the descendants. In this case, only one, but that's all of them. One cut, that's a clade. But here, in order to try and make this a clade, you have to cut that there and cut that there. That's not a clade. Nor is this right here. Yeah. Measure twice, cut once. There you go, Steely Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Run, <laughs> run your cladogram once. Cut once. Run your cladogram twice, or maybe two hundred times. 
Yeah. But Rhacodactylus says this this is a very helpful way to remember that. I like that. Yeah, good. Does this make sense? Is this helpful? Is this this visual explanation? Is that helpful? This is the sort of thing that should one million percent be taught in like very, very, very basic biology. You know? It should one thousand percent be like one of the first things that you ever learn in biology. Way before you learn, like, oh, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, or, or, uh, the Golgi apparatus is the garbage collector, or whatever. Like, that's detailed stuff that's, like, not super relevant, but this actually has, like, immediate bearing on our everyday lives. When we're thinking about the way that the world works, and we're thinking about which creatures are mo more closely related to other creatures. This makes sense of the world in a way that's, like, immediate, you know? When we see other creatures around and we're thinking about who's more closely related to whom, this is fundamental knowledge that you need in order to actually understand that on a level that's real rather than just arbitrary, you know? This should be taught in 7th grade life science exactly diagonal, exactly, and it would be... It would be taught... If it weren't for the influence of, well, creationists, really. Um, yeah, we just talked about this yesterday. Um, this, this, like, understanding of, of how life works, how we came to be, is incredibly important. Which has a long tail and teeth like a dinosaur. There's Archaeopteryx there. Just like a modern bird. Short clip here. How ancestors of modern reptiles evolved into creatures now extinct that share a common ancestor with mammals. Yeah. And how surprisingly whales evolved from large land animals that yep. returned to the water. And that's our topic for the day. Yes, indeed. Yes. And where the pandas book says we can't go from A to B. There, there are no fossils and we don't know how to study them. Actually, we've gone from A to B and to C, D, E, F, and G. We have the fossils, we have the, the, the transitional features, we have the ways of analyzing them with many different lines of evidence, and we're looking for the picture that accounts for the most lines of objective evidence. With each fossil, Padian refuted Panda's claim that different life forms appear suddenly by showing how fossils of extinct organisms bridge the gaps between species. Yep resulting in a picture of gradual evolution, just as Darwin proposed. The reporters in the courtroom they were just amazed that we knew all this stuff, and how come they hadn't learned about this stuff before? And the reason is, it's not in textbooks because the creationists fight so hard to keep it out. That's been a big influence. The reason why maybe hardly anybody in chat learned about this stuff in school is because... Well, it's because of the influence of creationists, honestly. Um, we don't want you to know about this stuff. As scientists, we know this. This is common knowledge. This is this is what we do, you know? And we get really jazzed about it. It is so exciting to learn about the origins of different groups and how they diversified. And then you get these great dynasties throughout the history of life that evolve and expand and take over the Earth. And then there's an extinction event and they die out. You have other groups that take over, and it's it's thrilling to learn about this stuff. You know, like maybe it's cool to learn about, uh, I don't know, the ancient Egyptian dynasties, or you know, different kings in Western Europe and their various dynasties and stuff. Honestly, what's way cooler than that is learning about these different dynasties of living things that changed and evolved and taken over and then gone extinct and then you get usurpers to the throne that take over after that and then get these vast dynasties that have like I guess my point is we can learn so much from the fossil record and this grand pageant of life on earth is endlessly fascinating And, and it, it troubles me that so many people in the general public, through no fault of their own, 
They don't know anything about this. It was never taught to them in schools, even though we know this stuff. And again, it's because religious fundamentalists find it threatening. And they've honestly been very successful in keeping that out of, of school curricula. And in people's knowledge, worldview is, is impoverished as a result of that. That's part of what I'm trying to do here, is trying to counter that, you know? I'm trying to bring this information to you, because it is so cool. It, it, it provides so much, I guess, meaning to life like that. Being able to understand what happened on our Earth millions of years ago and how that shapes the living things around us in our own, our very own lives. That's, that's so cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Science Stream says thank you for teaching. You bet. Thank you for everything you do, Science Streams. Appreciate that. Haley Stream says it's not just, it's also that it's not deemed important or understandable enough. We have this problem in Germany, too, and at max, you learn a little bit of cladistics in high school. Yeah, we don't have that in the U.S. Like, most high school students d don't even learn about evolution in high school in the U.S., Paleostream. Like, that's honestly kind of advanced and, and cool that you learn a little bit about cladistics in high school in Germany. That should be a worldwide thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Cool Seal says, I'm a product of my past, and that past actually goes back way, way further than my own life. Exactly, Cool Seal, exactly. Uh, and Stainless, welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Here, let's, let's finish out this video here. Um, go back a little bit. Let's finish so that it up. We can make predictions about who is related Major to whom welcome, on welcome. an evolutionary scale. So this means here. that if we want to be able to say that sharks, hagfish, and goldfish are all fish, we kind of have three options. One, animals like humans and beavers are fish. Two, you have to carve out some ridiculous definition, like fish would be any organism that is descended from the most recent common ancestor of both hagfish and goldfish, except for the subset of that group that is descended <laughs> from the most recent common ancestor of frogs and beavers, which is awkward, but it also kind of <laughs> defeats the purpose of cladistics. Or three, yep. fish as a scientific category don't exist. Yeah. I don't like the way that that's worded, but like fish is almost like a meaningless term because it includes all vertebrate animals. So in the end, are we fish? Well, we are all vertebrates and there are smaller categories like ray finned fish or sharks and rays, but there is yep. no single fish category in the cladistic approach. And this is true. This is true. When you look at our tree of life right here, you try and find one that just says fish and you won't be able to. That's because I guess fish is essentially, you know, equivalent to vertebrates here. But vertebrata is the term. Fish, you know, it's not super useful as a term like that. You know? If that sounds like scientists being unnecessarily pedantic, they do it for a reason. Despite the foibles, yeah. the cladistic approach has been a huge success. It helps scientists talk about the evolution yep. of life on Earth in a way that makes sense. And if there are some weird edge cases, it's not the fault of the system, but an opportunity to marvel at the history of life on Earth. And it also means that we use language in different ways based on what is useful this for is that important. conversation. That and I feel like if anybody, if anyone watching is still kind of having trouble with this concept, like humans aren't fish, well, this is what we're talking about here. Like we, we use language in different ways, depending on the context, depending on who we're talking to. When I say that, that humans are fish, it's meant to be a little bit provocative in the sense that I want you to think about us and about you know other creatures think about them in a phylogenetic way it's like it's a challenge to 
I'm challenging you to, to think about creatures within the context of their ancestry, within the context of their evolution on this planet. Does that make sense? So yes, mammals are fish, reptiles are fish, all amphibians are fish too. Fish, fish, fish. Because it's all about evolution. Living things change over time. We can study that. And that's what actually makes things make sense in biology. Yeah. We use language in different ways based on what is useful for that conversation. That means it's still okay to call a fish a fish. And if it's Lent, maybe even to include beavers in that category. There you go. Yeah. Here's a link to this lovely video there. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, uh... Hope that's... Yeah, I hope it does. And Quasil says, Well, frankly, we, non-biologists, very rarely know the ancestry of most animals. Yeah, and that's, again, through no fault of your own, Quasil. This sort of thing should be taught in schools. You know? But... Creationists and other religious fundamentalists do, unfortunately, a really good job of keeping that out of the school curriculum. So, yeah. Your mom is a fish, true? I mean, yeah. Your mom is also a primate, or a, a great ape, a primate, a Uarchontoglier, uh, a Boroeutherian, a Laurasia Theor, I think. That might be before Boroeutherian, and etc. You know what? We're actually going to put some of this stuff to good use here. Let's start today's game of Metazoa here. Using a phylogenetic approach to figure out what today's mystery animal of the day is. We have 20 guesses to figure it out. You ready? Hold on to your butts. Let's do it. So this is a really, really cool, like, daily guessing game. It's a lot like Wordle, if you're familiar with that. That word guessing game that took the internet by storm. Except in this one, you gotta guess the mystery animal. And so give me the name of a, a placental mammal, chat. Because this game is often biased toward placental mammals. Um, cow. Oh, or whale. You know, I like I like whale, Green Man Crow, Crow Beards. Let's try, let's try whale. Which is also an artiodactyl, like a cow. Kennedy. Um, let's try... Humpback Whale. And see if that... Oh, boy. Okay, nowhere close. Nowhere close. Um, Bilateria is the most exclusive clade... Again, a clade is an ancestor and all of its descendants. It's the most exclusive clade that includes the humpback whale and our mystery animal. So, let's let's take a look at that. Pull up a bilateria for you. These are bilaterally symmetrical animals. Which also includes echinoderms, I'll be enough. Oh! Cal Celtic Elephant says, at least we know it isn't a starfish. We don't even know that because echinoderms, like starfish, like uh, urchins, like brittle stars, like sand dollars, they're still bilateria. They've secondarily evolved radial symmetry after their ancestors had bilateral symmetry. So... Yeah, um, starfish and more are still within this clade, bilaterally symmetrical animals. But, but, this gives us some clues here. Maybe we've got 1.4 million species here? But if we're clever about this, we can still try and get this as, in as few guesses as possible. So... We guessed humpback whale, which is a mammal. We know that our creature certainly isn't a mammal. We know it's not a vertebrate. 
We know it's not part of those other clades or else it would have said that, you know? It's not a core date. It might be part of Nephrozoa. Let's try a protostome here. Give me the name of an insect or an arachnid or something like that, chat. And we'll see if our critter is a protostome. Jody Fish says Mayfly. Let's try that. Let's try that. Uh, Mayfly. And ooh, 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 that got us somewhere. It got us to within Pan Crustacea. Which, oh boy, mm, this is good. This is good. This is very good. This might not seem like an excellent clue, but oh boy, it is. It is actually. We guessed mayfly, which mayflies a uh, mayfly is a kind of insect. But it didn't tell us insecta here. So our mystery animal is not an insect. So we can basically cross off like one million species right there. We're narrowing it down bit by little bit. So many arthropods, I know, right, Diagonal? But that probably means that our critter is a crustacean or maybe some kind of other... No, it's not going to be It's not going to be an arachnid or another kind of arthropod like that. It's got to be a crustacean, right? Let's go from protostomes to pancrustacea. Yeah, there we go. So this is insects, crustaceans like this uh, shrimpy guy, and lobsters and crabs and other critters. But we know that it's not an insect, you know? Because if it were an insect, it would have said insecta. It doesn't. It says pan crustacean. So give me the name of a crustacean, chat. Crustaceans are barnacles, crabs, lobsters, shrimp. Isopods, etc. Um, we've got two mantis shrimps there. Steely Dan and Neverwinter both said mantis shrimp. Let's try mantis shrimp and see if that gets us anywhere close. Ooh. And you, uh, Malacostraca, there we go. It is part of this clade. Crabs and shrimps and lobsters and their relatives. There we go. We know it's part of this clade. We've narrowed it down to only 45, and well, let's say 46,000 species. Um, but it's not going to be a shrimp. So shrimp are part of that clade right there. We know it's not one of these, or else it would have said shrimp. It's going to be something outside that clade. Between there and you, Malacostraca, in general. So, it could be an isopod, or an amphipod, or a crab, or a lobster. Diagonal says, so not a decapod. Uh, I don't know. Are decapods actually a clade? Decapoda, within class Malacostraca. Let's, let's see. Crabs, lobsters, and shrimps are within Decapoda. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's not going to be one of these critters. Oh, boy. Not a crab, not a lobster, not a shrimp. It could be an isopod. Let's try that. They don't have isopod, but um, they do have pill bug. Should we try that, chat? Because pill bugs are not part of that clade, right? I don't think they are. They are Eumalacostracans, but they are not. Yeah, crabs, lobsters, and shrimps are over there. So it could still be a pill bug, I think. Pill bugs are in here, isopods. But let's let's try that. Hold on to your butts. Let's see if it's a pill bug. And no, it's not. 
It's not. Uh... I mean, that was a good guess, but it didn't turn out to be that. So it's something in between Mantis Shrimp and Pillbug. Um, so not an isopod, not, not a pill bug. What about krill? Is that going to be on here? Yeah. Eucarida are krill and crayfish and coconut crabs. I think those are part of Decapoda, aren't they? Or maybe not. No. Krill are over there. We could try krill. Uh, let's try krill. Hold on to your butts. Oh, okay, okay. That got it super close. A view to a krill. Uh, there you go, Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. Um... Let's see here. No, it was not Krill. A view to a Krill. <laughs> so it is a Eucharid, but just not Krill. Yeah. Imagine a krill or shrimp were as big as baleen whales. That would be pretty nuts, Charlie's Dragon. I think whales would have a difficult time eating them if that were the case. And Kel Celtic Elephant says decapods are still in the running. Are you sure? It's a eucarid, so it's not going to be a decapod, right? Um, there. Eucarida. Gojira X81, thank you for the follow. Sounds like you're in the right place. You a Godzilla fan yourself? With a name like that, I presume so. Welcome to Paleontologizer. We're not talking about Godzilla per se, but Godzilla is a portmanteau, or Gojira rather, is a portmanteau of Gorira and Kojira, Gorilla and Whale, and we're talking about whales today. So yeah. Anyway, welcome, Gojira. It's good to have you. Uh, crabs, lobsters, and shrimps? I don't think that... We've got krill, we've got... Who else do we have? Because uh... we, we guessed shrimp earlier, didn't we? We guess mantis. Are mantis shrimp not shrimp? Hang on, hang on, hang on. That would change everything. Are mantis shrimp not shrimp? Are they? Are they not part of that group? Mantis shrimp. Are no. Mantis shrimp are not shrimp. Oh, that really threw me off. That really threw me off. Oh man, misleading common names. Oh no. Oh no! Oh boy! This is why we use binomial nomenclature, chat. This is why we use those scientific names like Elima Neptuni. It's so that we don't get screwed up by like, oh yeah, it's a shrimp. It's gotta be a shrimp. It's not a shrimp. That probably wasted me like seven guesses there. Well, we only had five guesses so far, but. Um, let's try Fiddler Crab, I guess. I don't know. And holy cow! 
That was it right there. It, the answer was Fiddler Crab. Lucky guess. Holy moly. Yeah. Okay, okay. Not too shabby. We got that in six guesses. Could have been a lot worse. Could have been a lot worse. But yeah, yeah, holy cow. Um, yeah, so Mantis Shrimp or not Shrimp, and who said Brine Shrimp? Mayor Space. You're correct, Brine Shrimp are also not Shrimp. I actually, when I was in Berkeley this morning, I saw a talk about Brine Shrimp and their relatives. They are, they are not Shrimp. Um, yeah. What are sea monkeys? Let's take a look at this. Okay, okay. Hi, I'm Josh Clark. And have you ever wondered what sea monkeys are? Well, I'm here to tell you. They ate- They're not- from the sea and they're not they ain't monkeys either they're they're brine shrimp which are also not shrimp <laughs> uh they're they're more they're also called fairy shrimp they're not they're not shrimp they are a kind of crustacean but they're not shrimp eight monkeys turns out they're brine shrimp which are a pretty cool little creature in and of themselves. And hey, brine shrimp pie. are found in salt lakes, little lakes that are so high in salt content. They like the Great Salt Lake in the... Uh, and the algae they feed on in Utah. living in there. Nothing else can survive, which makes the brine shrimp and their algae friends extremophiles, which are life forms that are sponsored by Mountain Dew. The other cool thing about brine shrimp is that they can survive up to 25 years encapsulated in what are known as cysts, which are kind of protective yeah. layers that form around their eggs. Anyway, cool stuff, cool stuff. Um, sea monkeys, uh, brine shrimp, uh, the dark history of sea monkeys? Uh-oh, what is this? Huh. Alex Vixen. Are they domesticated? Especially bread species. We are about to tell you a story that you might think you know. But this unless you voice know that the Ku Klux Klan was involved, you're going to want to stick around. Oh, boy. Because the interface of humanity and the natural... Daniel says, don't watch it on stream? Okay. I think I remember this one, actually. Let's give you a link right here. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to... We're going to return to the warm embrace... Of the cetacea of our mammal friends there in the sea let's go back to our whales because we also have to try and get through this video let's continue in the water all of this because these animals have evolved to be an aquatic mammal yeah big How tangent talking about phylogeny and stuff end up in the ocean yeah for Eat centuries, pie. many people confused whales with fish, including the characters in the novel Moby Dick. Yeah, well, Herman Melville, you know, justice for Melville, he was right. They are fish. He was just wrong about the details. Even though in the 1750s, the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus had already classified whales as mammals, recognizing that among other traits, they have oh. lungs and produce. We've got more cat activity here, chat. Holy cow, Sweetie Pie. Welcome back. You were just. Look at that Egyptian flag right there. What do you think? Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> Sweetie Pie. Welcome back. Yeah. What are you up to? What are you up to? Squishes, I know you love that. There you go. Squish your face. Yeah, it's the best thing, isn't it? It's so good. Good stuff, sweetie. 
And Diagonal says, Melville actually collected a huge collection of literature about the facts on whales and put it at the front of his novel. Yeah, Diagonal. One of the greatest novels of all time. Moby Dick is phenomenal. Um, one of my very, very favorite books. And... right there. I don't know where I put it. But anyway. I had a tradition where I used to read it every summer in the field. And it's been a few years since I've done that, but maybe this year. Yeah. Oh, sweetie pie. You're not a fiddler crab. No, you're not. You are Felis Catus. Domestic cat. Aren't you? Aren't you, sweetie pie? What's that right there? You got a scab? Better not be a tick. What is that? There's something on your shoulder. Rahab Mahakala, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah, look at you. You are a fish, strictly speaking. You are a lobe-fin fish, because you're a mammal. And mammals are lobe-finned fishes. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh, thanks for dropping by, sweetie pie. You like whales? Swims with whales? I like whales, too. I like whales, too. Here's a thumbs up. Oh. Thumbs up for whales. What do you think, sweetie? Do you like whales as well? Yeah. Here, let's, let's get back to our whales. This milk. But where whales came from caused even Charles Darwin to scratch his beard. Inspired yeah. by a bear scene e. while it swam, he imagined how whales could evolve from land mammals. But faced with ridicule, he removed this idea from his later writings. Yeah. So Darwin had it right early on. His hunch had legs. Not from bears, could it but... be that whales hadn't evolved in the water? but were actually descended from mammals that once walked on land. Yeah. It almost seems like evolution had taken a backward step. It's a question that fascinates Hisham Salam. He believes clues can be found in the huge fossils that lie scattered in this desert. This is one of the most complete skeleton that we find in Wadi Hitan, in the middle of nowhere, you find a lot of really huge vertebrae lying up. The skull would be over there in that rock and the ribs on both sides. This is really spectacular, huge animal that <laughs> lived here in Wadi Hitan 40 million years ago. The Basilosaurus. Yeah, despite its name, Basilosaurus is not a dinosaur. Now don't don't eat the fur, sweetie. <laughs> oh boy, it's a whale. Uh, it, the name Basilosaurus means king reptile or like ruling lizard. Um, because at the time it was found, it was thought to have been a reptile. And then somebody realized, oh shoot, no, that's that's a whale. Yeah. fossils have been discovered in many parts of the world, including around 600 here at Wadi Hattan. Yeah. This one has been laid out in the place it was found. And Rahab says it really should be named Basilicetus. That would be cool, but that goes against the, the ICZN, the International Code on Zoological Nomenclature. There's... Here... Yeah, um, trying to find you a decent video here, but it's tricky. Um, let's try this. Oh, slow down, I can understand you. Alright, I don't... 
Goodness. I, uh, I don't, I don't speak Urdu or, um, what language is this? Yeah. Uh, anyway, good stuff. I just don't speak this language. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't speak Arabic, Jody Fish, no. When the first Bacillosaurus was studied in 1834, experts were baffled. When the early scientists found this, they thought it belonged to a kind of gigantic marine reptile. And uh, they, this is why they give it name Bacillosaurus, which means king lizard. Yeah. But the skull contains a clue to Bacillosaurus's true identity. This is the skull upside down, and you can see all the teeth is taken up. And this actually, they have incisors, canine, premolar, mammal teeth. Molar, really like our teeth, which is uh, actually a really good indication for this is not a marine reptile. This is actually mammal. So Bacillosaurus. Oh, yeah. The king lizard, it's actually ancient whale. Very cool. 40 million years ago, Bacillosaurus was the apex predator of its day. Yep. It could grow up to 60 feet long, the length of a bowling alley, <laughs> and weigh more than seven tons. A bowling alley. That's, I haven't heard that one before. Teeth made it a killing machine. Yeah. Sorry. Holy cow. Basilosaurus. Um, here, I can show you a clip from Walking with Prehistoric Beasts. Here we go. Let's try this. Oh boy. Yeah. Those are little Dorudon whales. Oh, wrecked. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they've been found in Florida, apparently. Yeah, they're probably pretty close to Cosmopolitan, I would imagine. Yeah, Bacillosaurus, cool that critter. Tons. Powerful jaws filled with sharp teeth made it a killing machine. Yeah. Scientists estimate its bite had a force of nearly two tons, enough to crush the bones of other whales. Yeah. Bacillosaurus was a prehistoric king of beasts. Yep. And there you go, Le Petit. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't initially shed much light on whale evolution. Or huh. how these mammals ended up in the ocean. And to find earlier ones. Still had legs first. Is it Phil Gingrich? It's a mystery that has intrigued Philip Gingrich for yeah. almost 50 years. One of the world authorities Pioneer on fossil whales. In the field of whale evolution, he was one of the first paleontologists to excavate at Wadi Hatem. So this is where I keep the fossils I'm working on. So and everyone was... dislikes him. You're thinking of Newt Gingrich, S.V. Harkin. This is Phil Gingrich. <laughs> the skull of Basilosaurus uh, uh... is upside down, and this is a model of it, a cast of it. These are all from Egypt, from Wadi Hitan, collected in 2005. 
here we are. I'm still working on them. It takes time. I'm talking about the King of Wales. Oh, gotcha, SVR. Yeah. He studied land mammals. <laughs> At the time, paleontologists had very little idea about the origins of whales. Look at the long vertebrae. In the Midwest of... look, at, look, at the, look at those stupid long vertebrae like that. Those elongate vertebral centra. What What are you even doing? That's nuts. Look at how long those are. Ah, weird and cool. Very little idea about the origins of whales. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest and I wasn't near the ocean and... I didn't know anything about whales. I knew so little that I wasn't interested. <laughs> in 1978, Philip went to Pakistan to search for prehistoric horses. Hmm. Instead, his team unearthed the remains of a mysterious creature. Uh... First thing we found was this skull. Back of a skull. It's not complete. The front, the heart with the eyes and the teeth and everything is broken off. When I first saw it, I had no idea what it was. I was probably disappointed because I was looking for horses, and it clearly <laughs> wasn't a horse. But I mean, it might it might be way cooler than the horse than a horse. Honestly, <laughs> it, let's be let's be fair. It's way cooler than a horse. Holy moly, it is. Uh, it's a walking whale. What it was, I couldn't figure out. The team it is an ungulate, though, yeah. Animal, but an even-toed ungulate. An artiodactyl, not a perissodactyl. million years old. When Philip took a closer look, he spotted something unexpected in the creature's ear. Yeah. So when you look at this an covering bone covering the ear, it's very dense, it's thickened, it has a sloping surface on this side. You only see this in one group of animals today. This is unique. In the true sense of the word, not it's not just special, it's not just cool or interesting. It is unique. The word unique is is a strong word. It's a superlative. It means that there's nothing else like it. It's, it's the only one of its kind. This is a unique bone. It is only found. And in modern mammals, those are only found in whales. And yeah. why? To enable them to hear in water. Yep. This ear bone, unique to whales and dolphins, helps them locate the direction of sounds underwater. Yep. It's proof of Pachycetus's pedigree. This bone was the key to understanding that Pachycetus is a whale. Well, that made it the oldest fossil whale anybody ever found. It was groundbreaking. Pretty cool. And as they discovered more Pachycetus fossils, they realized something else. <laughs> this whale could walk. Yeah, his legs. Yeah, Pachycetus. It's got legs. It's got legs. They. It's got long legs. They go all the way to the ground. Those legs. <laughs> legs for days. It's got legs. It's got legs in all the right places. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. A walking whale. Pachycetus. This whale could walk. Yeah. <laughs> these, these these whales were made for walking, you know? It's, uh... Yeah... Um, it's true. Yeah. Those whales were made for walking at first. And then later on, they decided that walking really wasn't for them.
Yeah. Did some whales go back onto land too? Maybe some groups did, but they didn't survive. Lepity, they uh, they died out. If there were any branches that, that went back onto land, we don't have them around today. They're gone. Uh... Yeah. You get it. You get it. This whale could walk. Yeah. Pachycetus is an animal a little bigger than a wolf. Probably built approximately like a wolf. It has teeth like a carnivorous mammal. But unlike a wolf that has claws on the ends of its toes, Pachycetus had tiny hooves. Yep, it's a hoofed mammal. It's an artiodactyl. Ooh, look at this. Pachycetus was a carnivore that hunted on land. Um, its anatomy suggests it had adapted to living in water. It, it probably spent most of its time in the water, from what I understand. You don't inv you don't evolve an involucrum like the that unique whale, you know, ear apparatus without spending the majority of your time in the water. Its long snout, full of sharp teeth, also allowed it to probe shallow riverbeds for prey. Its eyes were squeezed onto the top of its head, so it could keep watch while swimming. And some scientists think markings on its foot bones are evidence it had webbing between its toes, hmm. allowing it to hunt underwater. Why was Pachycita spending so much time in the water? I think it was because the water was full of fish. And judging from its teeth, it's pretty clear that they were taking advantage of that, going in the water, feeding on the fish, and didn't have much competition. Huh. And of course, it didn't take long until they moved into the water more permanently. So what I wonder, the question that immediately jumps to my mind in this case is, what about crocodiles? If these guys didn't have much competition, where are the crocs in this environment? Did something happen to the crocodiles that left an, a, a vacancy that ancestral whales were able to fill? I want to know the interplay between crocodilians and the earliest whales, because we've got a good sense that, that whales first evolved here. Near India, Pakistan... This area, up in here. This area up in here, before India had crashed into mainland Asia and driven up the Himalayan mountains, it used to be an island continent. So we go back to like 90 million years ago. India is still down here, and then it races northward over the next 40 million years and gets ready to... Uh, to crash into mainland Asia. There's India right there, India, Pakistan. Um, the earliest whales that we have are from in here. Was this an area that somehow lacked crocodiles or something like that? Is that what gave early whales their shot? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. In fact, we should we should check on that right now. And we can do that through Wikipedia for starters. Look at Pachycetus. Um, what geological formation is it from, and are there any crocodilians known from this formation? Uh, let's see. The early Eocene. History of discovery. The Kuldana formation of Punjab province, Pakistan. Kala Chita Formation is what they're calling it here. Okay. Kuldana Formation. Uh, we don't have a faunal list, though. What? Uh, 
Let's maybe look at Indo Hyas. Indo Hyas. There we go. Uh, so this is one of the earliest known non-cetacean ancestors of whales. So this is before whales split off. This is like, if a clade is the ancestor and all of its descendants, this is just outside of that clade. And it is from the... Nothing about the geology. What? I don't know. I still don't know. But it would be really, really interesting to find out if these whale ancestors evolved independent if, if they evolved in a place where there were no crocs because if there weren't any crocodilians maybe these guys could make a living being basically like a mammalian version of a croc I don't know why crocodilians would disappear from an area like that but maybe that's why we have whales today is because there weren't crocodiles at this particular time and place that'd be pretty wild Tenerim says, what makes you sure there were no crocs? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. It would be a really easy, simple kind of thing where it's like, if these guys are evolving to be the mammalian version of a crocodile, it would make a lot of sense if there were no crocodiles there at the time. But I don't know if that's the case. There probably are crocodiles there. I'm just not aware of them. I don't know. Yeah. And Rahab says... Might have been there just not many crocs around to pose a threat to their development. Could be. Could be. And Astrogosuchus is apparently a crocodile found in Pakistan. But is it from the same time, Rahab? There we go. From the late Oligocene. So this is way after. We're talking about the... The early Eocene here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I would be, I'd be fascinated to talk to somebody who knows a thing or two about this, these geological formations. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so how do we have animals like otters? They don't live with crocs. No, they do, Tomas. Yeah, no, crocodiles and otters do coexist. Um, that's actually a really good point, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, we get giant otters living alongside crocodilians. Um, like the Amazonian giant otter. Yeah, shoot, take a look. Hmm. And decad That's an interesting idea, Mastrictium. Huh, could be. Could be. Mary Ellis says maybe they lived in a colder climate than crocodiles. So India back then would have been warmer than it is today. India and Pakistan. They're just harassing this crocodile. This came in here. Remember of the alligator a day, I think? Oh, boy. These noises are nuts.
Otter Madness has ended. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? Oh, man. Holy cow. That is wild. Yowza. Wow. Shoot. Well, you know, giant otters are uh, formidable animals. A freshwater fish. This high productivity uh. of fish has resulted in a wide variety of fish predators, including human beings. Yeah, okay. Let's get to the otters. Make with the otters, please. Is the endangered giant river otter. Yeah. The largest weasel on the planet reaches 1.7 meters in length and weighs up to 32 kilograms. Holy cow. This Holy cow. Especially gregarious mammal is highly social and makes a number of vocalizations. These vocalizations convey aggression, alarm, and don't worry, be happy. They are completely adapted for an aquatic life. With huh. webbed feet, a tail used as a rudder, waterproof fur, and the ability to close their ears and nose while diving underwater. So when we're thinking about the earliest, like, sensitive. you know, cr critters like, like Pachycetus, whale ancestors, think of them kind of like otters. They would have been supremely well adapted to their aquatic ecosystem, even if they still have legs, you know? It takes a long time to lose your legs. And you could be fully committed to the water and still have legs before they disappear, you know? Whiskers allow them to track the longest the weasel. Sea otter is the heaviest. That makes sense, Golgonak. Sea otters get, get hefty. Yeah. They make 22 distinct vocalizations. Giant otter group size is 2 to 20 individuals. Anyway, here is a link to this video right here if you are curious. There you go. But, uh... Yeah, interesting stuff. When we're thinking about the earliest whales, think of them kind of like otters like that. You know? Yeah. Pachycetus marks the beginning of an eventful journey from land animals to today's gigantic whales. For Philip, it was the start of a lifelong passion. It changed the course of my entire career because I got interested in this as a, an example of evolution. It's especially interesting because it seems like it's backwards. It's back to the sea, not out of the sea. Yeah, well, that happens again and again in the history of life on Earth. The Terrestrial creatures moving into the ocean. Where life started. Around 400 million years ago, some fish left the water to live on land. Over time, their descendants evolved into amphibians, dinosaurs, and mammals. Yep. Then, about 50 million years ago, something incredible happened. Some mammals found their way back into the water. Yeah. They spread to all the world's oceans, evolving into the whales we know today. Pretty cool. Huge blue and sperm whales to orcas and porpoises. And that's actually really interesting, Diagonal. I hadn't even thought to ask about that. While plants moved from the seas to the land, very few plants have returned to the sea, though. Plants adapting to saltwater is very rare. That's interesting, Diagonal. But... But land-living vertebrate animals returning to the sea has happened again and again and again and again. Probably like 40 different times, maybe more, over the history of life on Earth. Because with, with marine reptiles, for instance, it's happened how many times? 
once with the ichthyosaurs, at least once with mosasaurs, maybe twice. We'll say twice. Once with nothosaurs, so we're up to, what, four? Five with plesiosaurs. Six with placodonts. Seven with the marine crocodiles. You also have thalatosaurs, which would be eight. Um, there's at least two other groups of marine reptiles, so that's like nine and ten. Ten different times at least. Creatures have moved into the sea. Hesperornithid birds would be 11. That's the 11th time that reptiles have, have moved into the sea. Um, this doesn't even include sea turtles. So that's at least 12. At least a dozen times just reptiles have returned to the sea like that. Now we have penguins, Jody Fish. That's 13 right there. Uh, flightless cormorants would be 14. And then you've got whales for mammals. You also have pinnipeds and sirenians. So we're closely up to like 20 times that, that vertebrate animals have returned to the sea. That's not even considering like mesosaurs from the Permian period. And there's a bunch of other groups that I'm like, I'm not even thinking of right now, I'm sure. So it's probably been like 20 to 40 times that marine, that, that you have vertebrate animals, tetrapods, that have returned to the sea. Sloths. There you go, Mascara. Yeah, Thalassinachnus and the other uh, marine sloths. Sea snakes, Kennedy. Great example. Mayor Space says, I like turtles. I like turtles too, Mayor Space. And arthropods too, like water spiders and beetles. Good rehab. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Irrefutable says, marine sloths? Oh, yeah, you bet. Here. Um, yeah, Thalassinachus and other marine sloths like this. Yeah, these are guys that are uh, adapted for marine life. Semi-aquatic ground sloths. So yeah, they probably spent the majority of their time in the water, kind of like a hippo. Uh, from the Miocene and Pliocene of the Pacific South American coast. Yeah, this is a, a hypothetical reconstruction of one kind of reduced fur for living in the water. Yeah, not quite ground sloths anymore, yeah. Ocean sloths, water sloths. Yeah. And igu yeah, marine iguanas are kind of in transition right now, Basil. They're kind of on their way to becoming marine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. Sea sloths. Yeah, Rahab. Neat stuff. So, anyway, it is not as unusual as you might imagine for creatures to return to the sea. Out of the sea. And what about platypuses? Well, platypus are, they're not marine. They're, they're, they're freshwater, Rayzilla. We're talking about creatures that adapt to life in the oceans. Um, and platypus never did that. They're freshwater. They've been around for a long time, too. But they've never gone marine, as far as I know. Yeah. And Ungoy says, weren't the big guys like brontosaurus, sauropod dinosaurs? Yeah. Were they previously thought to have been semi-aquatic? Yes. Now we know they weren't. They were actually really, really... they supremely poorly adapted for life in the water. For one thing, they'd be way too buoyant. But yeah. And Lurdosaurus... Lurdosaurus spinosaurus? Really? A big iguanodontian? Semi-aquatic? What evidence is there for that? That's not something I've heard before. Interesting. Yeah. And hey, Rayzilla, yeah. Sauropods mentioned I'm happy. Yeah, sauropods, they could, I'm sure they could swim. Probably really well. Um... But the thing is, they'd be very buoyant. They're all full of air. So they wouldn't be able to submerge themselves much. Uh, they probably had a pretty low water line. Like, they would not be able to do this. Like that, they would just go, thump. They'd, they'd just buoy up to the surface. Because these are animals that are all full of air. But it probably would have made them pretty good swimmers. Uh... They're like natural floaties, you know? Yeah. 
then Tom Holtz noted the sturdy limbs and huge belly of Lurtus source just a semi-aquatic mode of life similar to modern hippos. That's interesting, Dinosaur Dave. River Dinosaur of the Ancient Sahara? Huh! This big Iguanodontia in here? There's a coelacanth lurking below. Very nice. That's interesting. I didn't hear about that. Huh. Pretty interesting. Well, it's the first I'd heard of that. Thank you. For bringing that up, Spinonicus Art and Dinosaur Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to our cetacean friends here. We're going to try and get through this today. The oceans are thought to be where life started. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we'll see. Around hey, 400 pie. million years ago, some fish doing? left the water to live on land. Over no, time, here? their descendants evolved into amphibians, dinosaurs, and mammals. Then, about 50 million years ago, something incredible happened. Some mammals found their way back into the water. They spread to all the world's oceans, evolving into the whales we know today. From huge blue and sperm whales to orcas and porpoises. Oh boy. How did this transform? Well, this is not, I presume, you know, uh, somebody got who got whacked right here. It's not some Soprano stuff. Presumably there's a whale inside of there. Some kind of dolphin or somebody. And not, you know, a mobster. But let's see. Happen. To find out, scientists examine anatomical clues in modern like their whales theory. as well as ancient <laughs> fossils. By doing a dissection, they hope to reveal more secrets of their ancestry. Okay, let's unwrap. So this might be a little bit gross for anybody who gets squeamish like me, but I'm going to watch it too. I'm sure it'll be fine. You know. But let's let's be curious about this. Let's let's check it out. Like scientists. Comparative anatomist Joy Reidenberg is investigating a young beaked whale that was found dead on the coast of the USA. A mesoplodont! Oh, these are my favorite whales. They're so mysterious and weird. Some of them have never actually been photographed alive. Some of them are only known from specimens that washed up dead on the shore. Really, really cool group of animals. They're almost like fossil creatures, even though they're alive today, because some of them are only known from skeletons or from dead individuals. Joining her is evolutionary biologist Michael McGowan. It's huh. always really sad when you have a stranded whale. Yeah. But for us, this is a gold mine. We have an opportunity here to learn something about an animal that's quite rare. These particular species are rarely sighted at the surface because they just come up, take a quick breath, and go back down. What's really cool, yeah. I think, is beaked whales are really adapted to stay at depth. That's their norm. Yes. Cutting into the animal's Ugh. abdomen, Ugh. they reveal something curious. An important clue about the origins of whales. That's the stomach. Oh, okay. Now look at look how weird this is. These animals are carnivores. You expect them to be like a cat or a dog and have one stomach chamber. But, but nope, they got multiple because they are hoofed mammals. They evolved from mammals with hooves. They've got a multi-chambered stomach, just like cows. In fact, they don't. They have multiple stomach chambers, kind of like hoofed animals, like cattle or deer, or sheep. So we yeah. got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think wow. there's eight or nine chambers, which is crazy when you think about it's it. It's crazy. Wow. It's All whales and dolphins have this unexpected feature of multiple stomach chambers. It's a trait they inherited from their ancient relatives that walked on land. Yeah. Just like cows have multiple stomachs to digest their plant matter, whales have multiple stomachs to digest what they're eating, which is completely different. Fishes.
And it's not like they necessarily need those multiple chambers. I mean, maybe they make good use of them, but that's an evolutionary hand-me-down from their hoofed mammal ancestors. The, like, that's, a, that's a beautiful illustration right there. That these evolved from land-living hoofed mammals that had those multi-chambered stomachs. Like, you know, like deer or cows or bison. ...and squid, but it's still coming from the same structure as a terrestrial mammal it's just a throwback to their terrestrial ancestry of having a multi-chambered uh, stomach because their ancestor did very cool this anatomy is isn't more that cool gray fox yeah males are related yeah. to hoofed mammals yep they are hoofed mammals and this terrestrial heritage can even be revealed in their genes sweetie pie do you want to come over here hey Come here, sweetie. Let's see if we can bring another mammal over one more time, or if she's gonna be. Oh no, she's she's not having it right now. In his lab, Michael uses modern whales' DNA to map their past. Oh. It's opening up a vast new world of information about the origin. Hang on. Nope. Success, sweetie pie. How are you doing? Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff, sweetie. Good stuff. Here, have a treat. Yeah. You do not have a multi-chambered stomach because you're a carnivorous mammal. What are dinosaurs? Uh, Bunny Milk, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. I've come here to hair up your drink. Yeah, she's certainly, certainly got her tail all over that. Um, minimal hairs deposited, however. Not bad, not great. Anyway. Let's continue with the... Uh, what is this? The Whaleometer 5000? It's opening up a vast new No, that's a gene sequencer, isn't it? ...about the origins of whales. So if you think about different marine mammals, such as a manatee or a seal, a sea lion, they all swim and live in the ocean and have similar adaptations to whales and dolphins. But we can look at the DNA to see whether whales and dolphins are closely related to those other groups. And they're not. Or whether yeah. they're related to another species entirely. Yeah. Scientists wanted to identify the whale's closest living relative. Well, Afro Bennett Girl wants to know, has it been pinpointed what the first dinosaur was? We don't have the very first dinosaur, Afro Bennett Girl, but we've got the earliest dinosaur we know of right now is called Eoraptor. Here, let me, uh, watch out. I don't want to wheel the chair back and run over Sweetie Pie, so let's pull up an image here rather than me grabbing one off the shelf. Um, Eoraptor. It's got a skull like this. I actually have a 3D printed Eoraptor skull here in my office. This is the earliest dinosaur we have so far. Famous image by Luis de Hoyos right there. An x-ray of a human hand and that Eoraptor skull. Eoraptor would have looked something like... Uh, let's see, something like this. Right there. Good old Eoraptor. Not a very big animal. A little bit bigger than a chicken. It's a roughly like turkey-sized dinosaur but lived about 230 million years ago. And it's the earliest dinosaur we have so far. There will be earlier ones than this, but not much earlier. Oh yeah, yeah. 
Does that make sense? You bet, Aphrobatic Girl. Thanks for asking the question. Yeah. There. Let's get back to our whales. So they compared whale DNA with a range of other animals. Uh. They came up with a really surprising finding, and the finding was that the whale's closest relative using DNA was... Hippos. The hippo. Bingo. Yeah. Whales and hippos both descended from a common hoofed ancestor that lived about 5 million years before Pachycetus. So that's the thing, is that hippos also evolved from an animal that looked like this right here. This is like the ancestor of both the whales and hippos, we think. Which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And hippos have toes now, though. Yeah, yeah, they, so they kept their toes while whales got rid of them. Uh, or whales at least have them inside of flippers nowadays. But both whales and hippos evolved from this, you know, a critter much like this, like Pachycetus right here. From a uh, critter that looked like that. Yeah. Pretty cool to think about. And when you look at the Tree of Life... Uh, cetacea. Whales, dolphins, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Whales, dolphins, porpoises. You just say whales. Dolphins and porpoises are whales. Anyway, cetacea. <laughs> just outside of this clade... You got the hippos, too. Hippos are right there. So this clade right here, I don't know what it's called, but it includes hippos and whales. Um, let's look that up, actually. Hippo Potamus. Hippopotamidae. Is part of a clay. Oh yeah, Whipamorpha. I forgot. <laughs> we just talked about this the other day. Whipamorpha is hippos and whales. There you go, Celtic elephant. Whipomorpha is the name of this clade. A clade again is a group of organisms that's the common ancestor and all of its descendants. So Whipomorpha is a clade. Group of artiodactyls that contains all living cetaceans and hippopotamuses. Whipomorpha. What a what a oh man, I love that name. What a funny name. Yeah. The name Whipomorpha is a combination of English, whale, and hippopotamus. And Greek, morph, form. Uh some attempts have been named made to rename the suborder. Sitan Codonta, due to the misleading utilization of the suffix morpha for a crown group, as well as risk of confusion with the clade hippomorpha, which it... However, whippomorpha remains present. It's a better name, whippomorpha. That's beautiful. Let's keep it. You know? You don't always have to, to be an absolute stickler for all the rules 1,000% of the time, you know? Whippomorpha. What a wonderful clade name. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So whales and hippos? Whippos. Whippomorpha. <laughs> ah! Beautiful. The family resemblance is striking. Yeah. Some of the earliest whales like Pachycetus may have lived like hippos. Also, hippos get birth underwater. They nurse underwater. Their skin is... The rule of cool. Yeah, there you go, Casey Stoner. You know, it so counts for something. Interesting. Yeah. to think that maybe the common ancestor of whales and dolphins had these particular features. Yeah. But life in the ocean is very different from life on the riverbank. Over time, whales' ancestors adapted to this new environment. Scientists compared the DNA of hippos and whales to find out how. Huh. When we look at the genome of whales, we see that whales still have a lot of the genes from when they used to live on land. So they still have genes involved in smelling, sweat glands, color vision, producing saliva. 
but these genes are inactivated and they gradually degrade. But I think this is incredibly powerful evidence that shows that whales come from land ancestors, that they yep. still have these genes in their genomes, even though they're inactivated. Hmm. Over millions of years, whales lost many traits beneficial on land that had no use in water. But what happened to that most vital land animal feature? Legs. Legs. Hmm. Those are still kind of around in certain cases. Egypt, Hisham yeah. Salam's mission is to find fossils that can tell us more about how whales became fully aquatic. He's leaving Wadi Hattan to search a nearby unexplored area with older rock deposits. Ooh, 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 ooh. Here we are. Look at that beautiful Toyota there. Ready to find fossils? Sure. Toyota's gotta love them. Joining him are fellow paleontologists Sharuk Alashgar and Abdullah Gohar. From geological maps, they I love know the uniform this part too. of the ancient seabed is about two million years older than the deposits where the giant Basilosaurus was found. Ooh. They're searching for intermediate fossils that might shed light on how four-legged land mammals evolved into their fully aquatic descendants. And that's really, really cool. I mean, I, I want to pause for a minute and emphasize how cool this is. This is how science works. In science, we make observations, we test ideas, we find evidence and try and work things out. And that allows us to make predictions. So like if we find Basilosaurus in this one area, then if you go to rocks that are 2 million years older, you should find whale fossils that are older, that are more quote unquote primitive, that are maybe not as not quite as well adapted to the aquatic environment. Maybe they've still got limbs. Maybe they've got little legs, you know? Science is all about testing ideas, making predictions and testing them. And this is a beautiful example of that. This is a, a wonderful example of a, a paleontological experiment. You know, in paleontology, we don't always make experiments in the laboratory in the way that, like, you know, a chemist might do or a geneticist, you know, running experiments in the laboratory a lot of our experiments as paleontologists happen out in the field where it's like, well, if here's my idea about how whales evolved and if this is true, then we expect to find certain kinds of fossils in certain areas. The way that you test that hypothesis, the way that you run that experiment is by going out into the field and seeing if you can find them. It's a different kind of experimentation. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm hoping to find... Maybe a fall skeleton. And Rahab, I did not know that. That is funny. Uh, yeah. Some ancient whales that we didn't know much about. If we're lucky to find that this prehistoric animal here might have sturdy legs that can actually lift the body out of the water. So huh. this is what I'm trying to do is find more primitive whales. And yeah. uh, this is going to happen in, in maybe... Uh, in a few hours, for you weeks, few months, it depends how lucky we have. Colossus, is that Perucetus, Rezilla? We haven't really talked about that much, it's no. It's not long no. before fossils start to appear. Wow, look at this. Hey, what you found? We have a monster here. Oh my animal. lord. Where's our this closed is captions? Incredible. Yeah. Closed captions this. stopped working. Beast. Yes. This is a shark tooth. This is really huge shark. That's big. Really big. But there's still no sign of a whale. MacGyver says, behold, paleontologists in their natural habitat. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Look at that facultative quadrupedalism that paleontologists sometimes employ in environments such as this one. We have to have a fairly flexible bow plan. Uh, to adapt to our, our local environment in cases such as this. And then... Hey! They found something. Look at this. 
right here a small vertebra oh, right wow. there another one here amazing another one there so it seems like a um a complete skeleton well it's tapped into the yeah, there you go casey yeah up. could be the vertebral column going that way but this is definitely not basilosaurus the size of the vertebra is quite small With his expert eye, Hisham can recognize the shape of the bones immediately. I think this is a, a skeleton, and I do believe it might be the skull over there. Really Ooh, exciting. Ooh, a skull. Oh, 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 boy. Could it provide clues to how whales lost their legs? So this is definitely older than Basilosaurus because the Basilosaurus come later in the younger deposits. So this might be a kind of amphibious lifestyle whale, but with really sturdy hind limb. If we are lucky enough, we might find the bilbis somewhere and the hind limbs right here. Nice. Nice. And that wind picks up. Oh, they can it's ski goggles. More, they hit a problem. Wind. If it's actually getting too windy, we just have to leave the site and come when the nature calm down. Uh, I think yeah. we should stop. They mark the spot so they can return to it later. Until then, this whale's place in the family tree will remain unknown. So I'm sure they took a GPS reading there. Able to find the exact spot. And this this makes me so happy to see this. For a long time, uh, paleontology in Egypt was what we sometimes call parachute science. Where, you know, researchers will come in from other countries, they'll kind of, not literally, figuratively, parachute in. Find fossils, take them away to their laboratories in other countries, study them there, and there's nothing left in, in, in places like Egypt. Here you've got a homegrown paleontological laboratory. You have Egyptian paleontologists studying Egyptian fossils. That makes me really happy to see. Now, there will be all kinds of collaborations with, with paleontologists around the globe. But to have people in Egypt, Egyptian people working on Egyptian fossils, that's really cool. Just having that kind of you know, national pride like that. I think that's really neat. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, in their lab at Mansoura University, Hisham and Abdullah are investigating another new piece of the puzzle. Oh, and there's that illustration of of uh, Phyomyositis by Bobby Bozenecker. That's the same illustration that I have right here. Printed out in the frame. Good stuff. Yeah. Who is the guy that joined you for MTE? Um, uh, was he there at MTE? I don't, no, he wasn't. That was that was the year before. That was Bilal Salem, Jordy Fish. Um, yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Hang on. No, uh, you're talking about the other Egyptian paleontologist. Oh, goodness. Uh, uh, what was his name? Shoot. But, uh, yeah, he was maybe also from Mansoura University? But studying, uh, Thyreophoran dinosaurs, like stegosaurs. He was there for the sandwich stream. Yeah, shoot. Let's, let's find that Jody Fish. Yeah, here we go. Paleontologists make sandwiches live. <laughs> uh. Sorry, it's, it's the first cat I've seen in Kadab. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm ashamed. I'm, why is this name slipping my mind right now? Do you guys feed the cat? Or... I don't see. Did no, I did I miss any questions in chat? Everybody? There's Java right there who appeared on stream yesterday. Oh, Holy cow! Welcome, Raiders. Mister. Under the water, but it was um.
Uh, you're up late, Mom. She, I do these nighttime streams and you show up. Um, and here's the chat. So their messages will be right here. Here he is right here this from is Egypt. What I do five days a week. I talk wow. about fossils and this is how I do science outreach. Yeah. So, yeah. This is going to be kind of an unexpected stream, so people will be surprised to see this. Mm -hmm. But, uh, there we go, yeah. We've got our first chatter there, Dr. Tara. Hello, Dr. Tara, how you doing? You're the first here. <laughs> yeah. Nice, Sloppy Salamander, how's it going? Welcome back. Yeah. And uh, I'm surprised too, Tommy Plotticus, but it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing, you three. Uh -huh. It's good to have you here. And my mom is here. That's, that's my mom right there, Paleo Mom. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you're up late, Mom. She, I do these nighttime streams and you show up. Uh, Roland oh. Elliard, Zorox, Blake the Snake, Ironbark, Lenina. How are you doing? Shoot, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, what an hour for streaming. Yeah, I know, right, Musa? <laughs> I've had a long day, but I'm here in uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, Omar, would you like to uh, Omar. yourself? Say hello to everybody real quick. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's uh, Omar from Morocco. Uh, oh, from Morocco. I'm sorry. Omar is from Morocco, not from Egypt. Morocco has got some of the same uh, challenges that they're trying to overcome as Egypt at the current time, though, where they don't have like a big national museum, just in the way that Egypt doesn't have a big national fossil museum. And there's a lot of like parachute science that goes on there where people show up, they collect fossils, they take them out of the country, never to be seen again by the people of Morocco. But yeah, there's Omar from Morocco, and he is currently working on a really, really exciting and mysterious Thyreophoran dinosaur. It's a stegosaur that looks a lot like an ankylosaur. It's really, really weird and cool, and, um, yeah. So, like, hopefully you'll be hearing about this soon, chat, but Omar's working on it. I'm from North Africa, and uh, I'm here to participate in a conference about uh... Mesozoic ecosystems, and I will participate with an oral presentation here. And it's new, Casey Snower, yeah. I'm so happy to be here, and... Uh, Not speak Omelis, something uh, different, Spinonicus, something uh, different. I think I'm... <laughs> no, but I'm so happy and so glad to be here in Salt Lake. Omar's a great guy. Uh, in, uh, this is a pleasure getting to know him. This is Omar's yeah. first time in the United States, yeah. so please everyone say welcome. To Omar and people are already saying hello to you there. Yeah. Oh, says half of my fellow paleontologists. Yes, Jane, Dame Karen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, I'm so, so Omar's from Morocco. Working. I don't know how many times I'm going to be able to stream this week because I'm going to be at this conference, but we are currently making sandwiches for the other paleontologists, and uh, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Ethan and Lauren will be back in a minute here. Um, but yeah. There's Lauren right there, and Java! Salam, Omar. Welcome to oh, the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, Dakota, everybody. There's Ethan again. I'm Danny. We interviewed Ethan on yesterday's yeah. stream. Got a good drive? This is from June 3rd, 2023. Yeah, so this is fun. We did just kind of a chill stream, uh, of making some sandwiches and stuff. Dinosaurs, like duck bill dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs. We're very lucky. Some snaggletooth tyrannosaurs. Ooh. We have bits of ankylosaurs. Some of the first ankylosaurs from that time and place. So uh, we're hoping that our odds are good. Um, we've got a lot of fossils that are already in the ground that we just need to go and get out of the ground. Yeah, I've never been to TetsuCon, Spinonicus, no. Uh, in the dream. Yeah, and live streaming whenever live streaming. we can, too. So, um, yeah, um, anyway, you're... Uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool to go someday, really maybe, but... Right now because I don't know if I'm going to be able to stream at all for the next... I try and focus on... Actually leave for the field, because mm. we're, when we're at the conference... Conferences where I'm actually really presenting really research, busy. though. It's going to be a... Um, yeah, yeah, very, very much so. So... 
Um, so yeah, we made sandwiches later, like, during this stream. That's kind of what this whole thing was about. Okay. Yeah. And let's... Where's Java? Java Cat, where are you? <laughs> and how open to the public are those researcher conferences? Asks Le Petit Prince. Um, normally, you need to like register, and it costs money to do that. But you have a good ace. He's adorable as a cat. Oh, but you can do that as a member of the public. Um, that's totally a thing. You can definitely do that. Yeah. Uh, but usually you have to pay to register. Killing the game. There's Omar and oh. Java, the cat. Yeah, so the last ten to be ten. Oh, we're out. Oh, yeah. Hello. That's perfect. We were only uh, one short. Yeah. Nice. That's perfect. Have you can hear that purring. <laughs> She's meant for this. We just need to take her to Green River with you. <laughs> Good stuff. Anyway, yeah. Here is a link to that video if you'd like to watch the rest of it on YouTube. But yeah, yeah. And Rakodactylus says, I've crashed a few conferences because I've been too poor to afford registration. I've done the same thing, but wanted to go anyway. Just dress well and walk with confidence and you can see the poster session is no problem. I've done the same thing. There've been a number of like environmental science conferences that I've crashed here in the Bay Area. And it's been really cool. Had really fruitful conversations with researchers, working on stuff way outside of my realm of expertise. But yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And you don't even have to dress well. It's not a black tie affair, Le Petit. It's just, uh, you know, try, try and look like a researcher. Who are often not the best dressed people anyway. So yeah. Um but yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to our whales here. Let's continue. This is one of the most important discovery. Here we have nearly complete skull, a lower jaw some of the vertebrae and some of the broken ribs. This is a previously unknown species of ancient whale. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Is this Phyomycetus? The named it Phyumacetus Anubis. Phyumacetus. After Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of death. Yeah! Holy cow! Phyumacetus Anubis! Very, very cool. That is... The same critter that you see right here in, uh, in this that I've printed out for today. Art by Bobby Bosenecker, uh, old friend and colleague of mine. We have uh, a clear indication of very powerful predator that hunt everything around him. So we clearly can consider him the god of death for all living animals that <laughs> lived by him 43 million years ago. It's hmm. one of the oldest whale fossils ever unearthed in Africa. But could it walk on land like its ancestor, Pachycetus? Huh. The team hasn't found leg bones, so they must look for other evidence. Huh. Abdullah has found a clue in a bony projection on one of the vertebrae. This is the thoracic vertebra from the rib cage region. And you can see this is taken out. Bone here is called neural spine. It's very short in human here, but this is very clear evidence of walking lifestyle because the longer this sticking out bone, the more ability to hold massive muscles. That's yeah. The so tall neural spines or legs. So terrestrial mammals have or partly terrestrial. Very like long neural spine here. This is a cow. 
Yeah. But if you look at the modern dolphin, you can see clearly this sticking neural spine is much, much shorter comparing to the walking terrestrial animal. So this is fully aquatic, this is fully terrestrial, and Anubis in between. Very cool. Very cool. He believes that if uh. Anubis had strong back muscles, it probably used them for walking. Anubis, the god of death, was a formidable marine predator. Yeah. It measured around 10 feet long and weighed over a half a ton. That's kind of awkward in that. Extended periods in the sea where it hunted fish and turtles. Kind of awkward in this depiction, but that's just the but CGI. From the bones the team has found, they think it was able to come back to land, perhaps to breed. And it didn't wriggle out of the water like a seal. Anubis was probably a walking whale. Hmm. Yeah. Where are you going to go there? Thank you. To find out more about Anubis's place in the whale family tree, Hisham and Abdullah take the skull to a nearby hospital for a CT scan. Shall we get outside now? Yes, 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 outside. Very cool. Inside. Hisham wants to take a closer look at the position of Anubis's nostrils. Okay, uh, can you zoom? Uh, bit like a croc? Yeah, Dame Karen. Maybe maybe similar lifestyle to a crocodile. Striking. So here in Anubis, the tip of the snout is broken off, and uh, it could be up to here, but the nasal uh, opening would be right here. One third the way Ooh. down. Ooh. That's what we call retracted nares, when the nostril is not toward the tip of the snout, but it's moved further further back toward the eyes, that is a, a sign that this animal, well, where do you have good evidence that this animal was aquatic, but that's also, uh, that's part of that, you know? Aquatic animals tend to have retracted nares. Their their nostrils are closer to their eye sockets. They're, they're pulled back further along the snout. Back in the snout, uh, comparing to the modern whale, the blue hole would be on the top of the skull. Land mammals' nostrils are at the tip of the nose. Yeah. Modern whales' nostrils have moved to the top of their heads to become blowholes. Nice. Galumph. There you go, Golganek, yeah. But Anubis's <laughs> nostrils are a third of the way back on its snout. Nice. Yeah, look, they're retracted right there. So, here's the end of its snout right here, and those nostrils are pulled back. They're right there. It's one step closer to becoming fully aquatic. Very cool. Very cool. So how did walking whales lose their legs to become modern whales? Back at Wadi Hattan, Hisham takes a closer <laughs> look at the Silosaurus. Yeah. This huge marine predator evolved about three million years after Anubis. But could it support itself on land? Here is the arm of this beast. Ooh. It actually wasn't like a regular arm for mammals, but flippers to allow it to swim in the sea. Basilosaurus's front legs have turned into flippers. And at the back of the animal is something even more intriguing. Very cool. This is really something very cool in the well evolution this is the hind limb of this manister and this is a complete pelvis would be underneath one of these vertebrae that's like the complete that. pelvis there and this is the whole legs of this really huge animal. so small this so spindly right leg look at that femur. that's smaller than my femur the shame bone tibia and fibula and the foot yeah. Look at, look at that. <laughs> look how small they are. Holy cow. Vestigial. Vestigial.
Oh, man, and we're happy. Yeah, we talked about that on, uh, what was it, last Friday, I think? Um, yeah, early snakes. Or maybe it was Thursday. Anyway, on National Serpent Day, we talked about snakes losing their legs, and they went through a stage like this, too. Yeah. The yeah. Bacillosaurus's legs hey, cheese and pickle, were welcome. smaller than the arms of a human. Yeah. Definitely Barely there. Definitely, Bacillosaurus cannot walk, given the size of this hind limb, yeah. comparing to the whole body 20 meter long just totally cannot support walking on land yeah. just like t-rex hand do nothing yep yeah. unlike its walking whale ancestors bacillosaurus was fully aquatic but in modern whales are there any remnants of their walking past? What do you think, chat? Are there remnants of whales walking past in their anatomy today? Hmm, yes or no, what do you think? Uh, probably, indeed, yes, 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 yes. Well, let's, let's find out. Back in the lab, Joy Reidenberg and Michael McGowan are looking for more clues inside the beaked whale. We're now looking at the flank area, and I'm going to show you something really cool in this area. Right in here is a small bone, something that is really a throwback to the ancestral condition of having hind legs. All that's left is a little remnant of a pelvis. Yep. Look at this that. This tiny pelvic bone is hidden in the whale's hindquarters. It's where a hip hips bone. Would once have been. Yeah. The only thing it doesn't have is the connection back to the spine. So ours is connected in the back to the spine. This one is just free floating. It's tiny. It's actually a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. This pelvis is so interesting because it's a throwback to the land animals that were using a pelvis for walking. But whales aren't walking. They don't have hind legs. Pretty cool. What do you think, Sweetie Pie? Do you want to come up here, or are you just going to march around on the floor? Oh, oh, meow, meow. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, do you want to come up here? You come say hello? You've got legs for walking. Yeah. Anyway, we can, uh, we can see. Um... We can see the pelvic remnants within modern whales, like this bowhead whale right there. A sperm whale. You've got the remnants of the pelvis right there, just kind of free floating within the bulk of that whale there. You know? Yeah, vestigial pelvis there in that bowhead whale. And there it is in a humpback whale, Megaterra. It's the genus, I believe. Oh, and look! Once again, we have. Sweetie Pie here. We've just had a wealth of mammals appearing on today's stream, haven't we? Hello, Sweetie Pie. Yeah. Oh, look at you. You seem fascinated by my Egyptian flag right there, huh? The good stuff? <laughs> uh, yeah. Are you not getting enough attention from Lord Ionios right now? Is that why you keep coming back? Is that why you keep coming back? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, cat kisses. <laughs> we get some cat kisses. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Should I put some catnip on the camera lens in the future? What do you think? That'd be a good idea? joy. What a joy, sweetie pie. Do 
I need to put a cat bed up here or something? Would you enjoy that? I bet you you would. I bet you you would. I bet you if it were heated. An electric cat bed up there on the wall. I bet you'd be all over that. Cat mint bush. Nice, Raham. Yeah. Oh, thanks for making another appearance, sweetie pie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. So pretty, sweetie pie. So pretty. You're nudging the camera. Yeah. Oh. Good to see you. Thanks for visiting me again. Can you smell a microphone? with our our whale video shall we what do you think sweetie let's do that all modern whales still have a pelvis and some have tiny hidden leg bones too nice but why would a whale need a pelvis well they don't need more it has function part of that function is to anchor the muscles of the belly for swimming so it's still being used in locomotion, just not with legs. So think about hmm. in the front, you know, we have the six pack muscles. Yeah. These help to bend the body in this downward motion like that. So that's part of the swimming action. Oh, wow. They okay. anchor on this bone. They anchor in other places too, but they also anchor on this bone. And that's another remnant of its mammal past is that they yep. move their spine up and down. And with fish and even reptiles, they move side to side. You watch yep. a snake move, you watch a crocodile walking. They're swimming like fish, but on the land yeah. with legs. When side to side, mammals, that lateral motion. Pretty, the spine and the body come off the ground, yeah. and now they're free to gallop. Oh. What are you looking at, sweetie pie? What are you looking at? What do you see? What's going on? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Looking for some attention. Oh, you got it. You got it, sweetie pie. Yeah. <laughs> I ought to do it since I watched this episode. It's so fascinating. I know, isn't she? She's endlessly fascinating. And there she goes. No, I know you're talking about this documentary. Cool. I'm really glad you watched this, Otter. That that makes me happy that that people who you know might watch me on Twitch are also interested enough in natural history to watch documentaries like that. That's super super cool. It's good to see you, Otter. Good to see you. And when whales went back into the water, they kept the up and down spinal movement, so they're still galloping in the water. Yeah. Losing their legs was just one change whales underwent as they adapted to life in the ocean. Very cool. To survive in this underwater environment, whales' limbs grew stronger, making swimming easier. They grew horizontal flukes on the ends of their tails, and yep. front limbs began to turn into flippers for stability and steering. As they moved to tail-powered swimming, their bodies became more streamlined, hind limbs shrank, and their spines grew longer. Yeah, good stuff. 
before they got to this point, though, when they're still about here, with, like, at the Remington Aceta stage, or thereabouts, their bodies looked very different. And, and let me show you a clip from, uh, from Netflix's Life on Our Planet. Was it Remington Acetas? Oh, maybe they don't have that. Shoot. Oh, was it my Acetas? Yeah, here. It was my Acetas. Take a look. Your journey into the oceans was a gradual one. And if you've not yet seen this series, holy cow, you really ought to check it out. Um... It's narrated by, uh, uh, by Gordon Freeman from that famous video game series, Halo, I think it's called. Um, you, you were all on Twitch, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Life on our planet. It's excellent. It's on Netflix. These are my assistants. Myocetus. Long ancestors of the whales. Yeah. But unlike whales, they still spend much of their time lazing on land. It's in the water that they come alive, chasing schools of fish. Rob says, I liked this documentary, but they used the word dynasty far too much. I actually really liked that. I found that charming. It's it's a hook that, that draws people in, you know? I like that. So that's the thing. A lot of... I've seen a lot of really, like, kind of wheedling criticisms of life on our planet... I've tried not to pay much attention to them. But... Yeah, like this person... ...of October. In other words, right in the thick of the planet, to assess the mannerisms and behaviours of... ...destined to be ousted by new, more evolved... Anyway, this person, I guess didn't like the series very much or whatever, but I don't know. Like, the thing is, you got to recognize that it's not designed... They didn't create this for the same audience as people who would be watching Prehistoric Planet or who would be watching Walking with Dinosaurs or something. They're aiming for a broader audience here. This is for a Netflix demographic. It's for everybody. And so certain things are going to be kind of dumbed down a little bit. The animals might be anthropomorphized to a certain extent. You might have the repetition of certain phrases like, you know, this new dynasty arose, dynasty took over the world, that kind of thing. But the broader you aim, sometimes the more you have to kind of alter your content a little bit for that. I think they did a really, really good job here. And never before, may, or maybe not since Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which is mostly about other things than the history of life on Earth, has this kind of content been able to reach such a wide audience. And kudos to them for doing that. Holy cow. This is just a, you know, another feather in their cap here. This, this depiction of the, the evolution of whales really good stuff really good stuff like whales they still spend much of their time lazing on land uh. it's in the water and there you go Casey Star. yeah yeah chasing schools of fish well that's not enough you got to add some drama to it Gotta keep things interesting for a general audience. So what's the drama that they add to this? His Swimming around in the water? He was limited by how long he can hold his breath. 
He seems caught between two worlds, especially when facing danger. There we go. So how do you elicit drama in a situation like this? Yeah. The mammal's intelligence is his only defense. And Retro Roadshow says, don't tell me he has to hold his breath. Now I have to hold my breath, too. I mean, yeah. That kind of verbiage, I'm sure, was very intentional. Where it adds to the tension. It adds to the drama. As a mammal, you relate. You go, oh, sh he's holding his breath. I'm holding my breath. There's a shark there. How's, how's he going to get out of this one? But he can't stay down here forever. Yeah. The Myocetus is running out of air. In open water, there's no escape. And overhang off his refuge. Uh. But time is running out. And what happens here? Well, you'll have to watch Life on Our Planet to find out. No spoilers. <laughs> if you have Netflix, check it out. It's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, seriously, though, check it out. It's It's surprisingly excellent. Um, I, I've been, I've been really impressed with Life on Our Planet so far. I still haven't watched the last episode, but it's good stuff. It's good stuff. They moved to tail-powered swimming. Their bodies uh, became more streamlined. Hind limbs shrank. They go retro. And yeah. their spines grew longer. They had become fully aquatic and were unable to return to the land. Oh, and we had a really good question here about pinnipeds. Uh, somebody was asking if whales were to go extinct, if pinnipeds would step in and fill that niche, or swim in and fill that fill that niche. It's a good question. I don't I don't really know. Um, pinnipeds do seem to arise after whales. I think pinnipeds are are seals and sea lions and walruses and their relatives. Uh, whoever asked that excellent question. We don't know. Yeah, there's a chance they would fill that niche. I don't know. Yeah. The desert at Wadi Hattan is dotted with the skeletons of some of the first ancient whales. But around 34 million years ago, they mysteriously vanish from the fossil record here. Huh. In an area about 50 miles from Wadi Hattan, Sharuk Alashkar investigates why the whales disappeared from this region. Oh, they were probably killed by these giant trees. That's a shame. These strange objects provide an answer. This is fossilized wood. It seems like wood, but it's a rock. The wood replaced by silica and minerals, so it's so heavy. But it's okay, a good it's indication <laughs> that this area one day was a forest. Yeah, so the, the water dried up. Was very tall, sea levels dropped. To 50 meters long. Colorful birds flying in the area, turtles, snakes, full of life. The fossilized wood is around 34 million years old. Yeah. It's a sign that this area once a thriving ocean underwent a dramatic change yeah um it developed uh less water <laughs> it 
It was de-oceanified. <clears throat> At that time, Earth's climate began to cool. If a tree falls on a whale and there's no forest, do you hear it, Retro Roadshow? I, that's a good question. I don't know. Kelly Cakes, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. We're talking about fossil whales right now in the Egyptian desert. Welcome, welcome. How you doing, Kelly Cakes? The Antarctic ice sheet formed and sea levels dropped. Yeah. The Tethys Ocean receded, forming the Mediterranean. And you know what? The actual big change right here might be the formation of the Isthmus of Panama. So when North America and South America finally met up and kissed there at the Isthmus of Panama, these ocean currents that used to be able to move through here between the two continents stopped. And this had tremendous, tremendous impacts around the rest of the world. Actually, you know, this might even be before that happened, but that did have tremendous impacts. There's something else that happened that caused the formation of the Antarctic ice sheets, and that dropped global sea levels. The yeah. Tethys Ocean receded, forming the Mediterranean. Yeah. And where whales once swam in warm, shallow waters, a forest grew. The primitive whales that lived in Wadi Hita, all of them are died out. Fortunately, some of whales adapt with the climatic change. Yeah. Whales are mammals, and mammals are warm-blooded bodies. So they can adapt with the cold water and find new places to live in. Being warm-blooded, they were able to generate their own heat and yep. grow blubber to insulate their bodies from the cold. Allowing Endothermy, warm-bloodedness is a big advantage. All over the world. Yeah. But the whale's story doesn't end there. Ooh. Look at all those whale. Holy moly, where is this? At the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. I think this is the world's largest collection of whale specimens at the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C. Holy cow. Look, look at that. Look at that. Are we going to see Nick Pines in here? In a warehouse at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History is the world's largest whalebone collection. Oh boy, what did I just tell you? Yeah, yeah, holy cow. I got that one right. Yeah. It holds remains from nearly 10,000 whales. Evolutionary biologist Ellen Coombs scans their skulls to investigate how they've changed over time. Very cool. That's some kind of dolphin there. Studying the skull is really important because in Wales, it's where a lot of changes have happened over their evolutionary history because it houses a lot of sensory organs, the eyes, the nose, the brain, and this can tell us lots of things about how the animal has evolved to eat and live its life. Yeah. The 3D scans allow Ellen to look in detail at the more recent chapters in the whale's evolutionary tale. Very cool. Like the when STLs the available? Yeah, Retro Roach. I want to print those. <laughs> the modern whale's journey began. Hello. The creature we will be examining is a paleontologist. Welcome, actual education, to the stream. Welcome, welcome to paleontologizing. How are you doing? It is good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Hey, hey to you too, actual education. How are things? It is good to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. We're talking about the fossil history of whales right now. Uh, oh, hang on. Um, get that restarted. There we go. Sorry, this camera sometimes needs some product. But welcome. And Dr. Gold Raid, Dark Aspect, how are you doing? Uh, Pubga Lux. It's good to have you here. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. Talking about fossil science. And sculpin, holy cow. Look at that lovely bird right there. 
that Tinumu bird, heralding the arrival of ten gift subs from the very generous Sculpin. Really appreciate it. And... Oh, shoot. Uh-oh. Sculpin01 is overloading the system with ten gift subs. What? Thank you, Sculpin. Holy cow. For those ten gift subs, I really appreciate that, Sculpin. Thank you, thank you. Actual education. It's good to have you here. Are you also in the business of, of doing... Education here on Twitch, like I am? My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Normally, I'm talking about dinosaurs and dinosaur science here on Twitch, but today... We're talking about the evolution of whales. And as the fam in the whales' evolution. Yeah. Um... So yeah, you caught us on kind of a special day. Anyway, it's uh, it's good to have you here, Actual Education and Raiders. How did your stream go? What category were you streaming in? And I would, uh, I'd love to know. You wanna get a shout out for, uh, for Actual Education here? And Actual Education and Raiders, would you like to see a quick welcome video to introduce you to this channel? to tell you what paleontologizing is all about, because I would love to introduce you to a good friend of ours by the name of Previously Recorded Danny, who would be thrilled to tell you about how this channel came to be, why there's a paleontologist here on Twitch, all that good stuff. Give me a one in chat if you'd like to see a welcome video with Previously Recorded Danny, and uh, let's see if that summons him. Um... Type of one in a chat. I'm seeing some ones. Okay, okay. Um, Misty M is giving us a one, and that's a new chatter right there, Misty M. And Diziet Sma also gave us a one. Well, without further ado, we're gonna bring forth a good friend of ours, previously recorded Danny, who is sneaking up behind me right now. Hang on. He's very eager. Sorry. Previously recorded Danny is gonna tell you a little bit about what this channel is all about, who I am, what my background is, all that good stuff. I don't like to talk about myself that much. He's, frankly, much better at it, so we'll let him take center stage here. Previously recorded, Danny, it is your time to shine. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well... My name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell ya. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the paleo lab at Museum of the Rockies which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you are more familiar with that institution, and with my old boss, than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of fieldwork, digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Gasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, 
Trurarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs. But I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana. So I packed up and moved back to the West Coast. And I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. 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 Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion. And now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny, and thank you even more to our new friends from Actual Education with that raid. Actual Education, thank you so much for raiding in. I really appreciate it. Welcome to the channel. It's really good to have you here. Holy cow. Um, I don't have a... Because if they're removed, America loses them forever. Well, 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 actual education, thank you so much for subscribing. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. That means a lot to me. It really does. And that helps keep me here online. Thank you for that, that support. And enjoy those emotes. Like these, and these, and these, and these, and these, and these, and these are all yours to spam in whoever's chat you'd like to. That's the cool thing about spamming dinosaur emotes is that people tend not to get mad about it. They're like, wait, are those dinosaur emotes? Where did you get those? I'm not even mad. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Um, but yeah, 
That was great, been watching this whole stream, but not managed previously due to UK time difference. Well, uh, Diziet, I, I appreciate you. It's good to have you here. And, and now you've got an idea of what this, what this whole enterprise is all about, you know? Yeah. Anyway, actual education is good to have you here. And let's get back to what we were talking about. I am going to uh, go eat some dinner soon. We got to finish out this documentary. This is uh this is about the evolution of whales. And it's good stuff. Let's continue. When the last of the ancient whales died out. The modern whales journey began. Yeah. And as the family tree continued to grow, something surprising happened. Some kept their teeth like yep. orcas. The odontocete whales, whales and dolphins. The toothed whales, odontocetes. And some like the blue, humpback, and right whales, the mysticete whales, and developed baleen. A new filter feeding tool called baleen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you could almost come up with a, a parody Dolly Parton song. Baleen. 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 I'm begging of you, please don't take my krill. Um. <laughs> <laughs> one could almost do that you know <laughs> this is the underside of the mouth of a humpback whale which is one of the baleen whales and what uh... makes it a baleen whale is what's going on here so this is baleen uh, this sits where teeth would normally sit in something like a killer whale or a dolphin but instead they have these amazing plates of baleen and they go have yeah yeah cool things, stuff like our hair or nails and you can see that it has these kind of hairs on the end here which are used to filter out prey and what they do is they suck in a big mouthful of water full of fish or krill which is what they eat and then they use their tongue to force out that water and capture all of their prey in these plates of baleen and that is sometimes up to half a million calories in one mouthful. Holy cat Half a million calories. 500,000 calories in one mouthful. That's nuts. Wow. But yeah, Rahab makes a good point there. Yeah, the evolution of baleen is really interesting and complicated. I'm going to sneeze here. Or maybe not. Um, but yeah, we, when we're tracing the evolution of baleen whales... Uh, so they evolved from toothed whales, obviously. Whales originally had teeth. But sometimes you get, like, whales that have both teeth and baleen at the beginning before they completely lose the teeth and replace it with baleen. It's interesting stuff. But yeah. Yeah. There you go, Casey Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and there was a... Uh, not baleen per se, because baleen is a whale thing, but there is a pterosaur, Casey Snow Art, that did develop something kind of similar called pterodostro. Yeah, so there's a pterosaur that seems to have had bristles in its mouth like that for, uh, for sieving tiny prey out of the water. Pterodostro. Cool critter. Very cool critter. Yeah. Um, and there's a fossil of that animal. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Teeth evolved into a toothbrush. There you go, Sparky Bug Watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Pterodostro. Um. Yeah. Anyway, we're not gonna we're not gonna dive into that tangent too far now. I gotta finish this. Why did these whales take such a different path from their toothed cousins? Uh, Here we can see a blue whale skull. The main thing coughing? I don't know. Is how flat the Bacchiotomy? Is, I'm not sure. How wide the mouth is, and these are perfect adaptations for mass filter feeding with baleen. Yep. Meanwhile, the toothed whale has evolved a very different skull shape. Yep. So if we take a look at the skull of this killer whale from the side, you can see that the forehead is concave. This is because it houses a load of organs that are used for echolocation. Yeah. So only the toothed whales have echolocation. They've got the Highly that big melon there. Highly of echolocation has evolved in some animals like bats and whales. 
And oh, it's even some people have developed this too. Like there's a blind kid from Sacramento who could actually like it seems like you could echolocate by making clicking noises and then listening to the Oh, can I find that real quick? Uh, I shouldn't be going off on tangents like this, but um blind kid Sacramento echolocation. Uh, yeah, check this out. Ben Underwood is blind. The, I'll give you the, the link to this video so you can watch the rest of it if you'd like to. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of amazing what what a big brain is capable of in a mammal. Like Ben or or like a whale, you know, it's seeing this, it kind of makes it easier to understand how echolocation evolved in whales, you know? And yeah, this is this is real stuff. Dark aspect. Really, really cool. Yeah. Um, here, I wonder if. Um, if there's is there a Wikipedia article about him. Uh, yeah, American echolocator. Ben Underwood was, oh, he died? A blind American who was born on January 26, 1992 in Riverside, California. He was diagnosed with retinal cancel, cancer by age of two and had his eyes removed by age of three. He taught himself echolocation at age five, becoming able to detect the location of objects by making frequent clicking noises with his tongue. Uh, he passed away in 2009 due to cancer. I did not know that. R.I.P. Ben Underwood there. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, but human echolocation. You can read more about that right here. Good old Wikipedia. What's the, oh, and Claire already posted that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Whales see by emitting high frequency calls. The highly specialized skill of echolocation has evolved in some animals like bats and whales. And humans too. Yeah. Whales see by emitting high frequency sounds and then listening for how they bounce back off objects to find Pretty cool. prey in the depths of the ocean. And that's essentially the way that we see too, is we're seeing photons. You know, our eyes are picking up light that bounces off of objects. That's why we can't see in the dark, you know? It's because there's no light to reflect back to our eyes and tell us what's going on. You can do the same thing with sound. You can see sound if you're a whale or a bat or uh, Ben Underwood there. Pretty cool, right? It's the same principle as, as seeing with your eyes. You're just detecting waves bouncing back to you. do this in a very specialized apparatus in their forehead. The key ones being the phonic lips, which make and a high frequency clicking yeah. sound. Yeah. And the melon, which is a fatty organ, which helps to focus these high frequency sounds as they leave the animal. Huh. But how this skill evolved is still a mystery. Yeah. So we have ancient whales dying out. We know they could not echolocate. And then we have the appearance of the early toothed whales that could echolocate. So there's a gap uh, in there where there'll be several fossils that have maybe very basic echolocation, and they're the fossils that we really need to find. Yeah. Scientists think these early whales survived to pass on their genes to their offspring. Spelling is just tasting at range. There you go, Sir Lurkslot. Yeah. Gradually improved. Yeah. Same sense. Today, some toothed whales are such efficient predators, they even hunt their baleen cousins. Oh, and Claire, I'm sure this is going to be cool, but i got to wrap this up pretty soon. I see everything that you see, except I don't see like you do. I release a sonic wave from... Huh. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> So these humpbacks have evolved new survival strategies. Hmm. 
back in the Dominican Republic, Joy Reidenberg and marine biologist Mithriel Mackay are on a whale watching mission. There's a blow around one o'clock. And it's the third? Yeah. There's four. There's four there. Most whales live in family groups and have complex social lives. Mithriel and Joy want to understand how certain behaviors give them an evolutionary advantage. Huh. We look at the behaviors and then we start asking questions. Why are they doing those things? Because the answer to the why gives us the reason they evolved this way. Huh. Oh, that's awesome. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Look at how she's putting the baby out of the Yep, she'll scoop under and pick it up. And she's using that, <laughs> that flat surface of the top of her head to hold the calf there, almost like it's got a cradle surface. So she can give the calf a rest this way. If she feels like the calf's in danger, she can pull this calf right up out of the water. Huh. And there's the male. This mom is being pursued by a male. She's putting the calf on her head to protect it from his aggressive advances. Hmm. Mithriel thinks this protective behavior plays a role in baleen whale survival. Picture them out and killer whales coming up and seeing this baby as a good meal. The moms that are able to use their flat head to scoop the baby up out of the water and get away are the ones whose babies are gonna have babies. Huh. We're always taught evolution changes things, but it doesn't, what it really does is it eliminates the stuff that doesn't work as well. So yeah. what's left is what works. It's yeah. reactive, it's exactly. not proactive. That's a good way to put and it. These whales That's have true. one other vital defense mechanism. Their huge size. How did they get so big? The ancestors of these whales were actually smaller than our current whales. That yep. made them more nimble. Whales they could swim through the water more Uh I shoot, up until like last July, I would have said whales are the biggest they've ever been. But the discovery of Peru Cetus shows that whales actually got really, really big really, really, really fast. And I wonder if this documentary was produced after that discovery. So, like, or before that discovery, I mean. So they, they might talk about this, like, idea of gradual whale uh, embiggenment, where whales actually embiggened very, very early on very fast. At least certain lineages, like Peru Cetus did, and then they went extinct. Agilely picking out fish. But when we look at these large baleen whales... They are feeding in a completely different way. And that yeah. is partly what's allowed them to get so big. So having large bodies means they have large mouths. And the large mouths allow yep. them to get a lot of prey. Look and at that. Having a large body also allows them to carry a lot of fat reserves. That that's amazing. Did you let's let's look at that again right there. Look at this footage. And just appreciate this with me right now. How much the, the gullet of this whale, ex not the gullet, but like its mouth expands like this. Those pleats unfold there as as those mandibles open up. Holy cow. So having Look, large watch, watch, watch. Means they have large mouths, and the large Look at that. Look at that. And having a large body also allows them to carry a lot of fat reserves, which they are Nuts. using for swimming yeah. to the regions where the prey are. But having that absolute big size is something that really evolves because they're in water. Yep. You know, that biomass would be very hard to support on the land. Would... Yeah, the dinosaurs mastered this. Sauropod dinosaurs in particular could get larger than whales on land and heavier than whales on land because whales are effectively weightless. Being in the water allows them to get tremendously large because they're effectively weightless. In the water, you know, that mass would be very hard to support on the land they would just be crushed yep and they are when they go up on land you do not want to see a whale on land Whales transition from four-legged oh land mammal to the giant of the oceans is one of the most extraordinary stories in the history of evolution has the mystery of whale evolution been solved did that whale just eat a dolphin no clever so the a whale could not eat a dolphin like a whale like this uh are these humpback whales? 
The blue whales? What kind of whale is this? Those are, those are humpbacks. Look at the look at the big that big paddle. Um, that big fin. That's Megaterra. That's a humpback whale. Their gullet is only about the size of like an orange or something like that, or a grapefruit maybe. Like they don't have a very big throat, so that they can't they can't swallow a dolphin. You know that biomass yeah. would be very hard to support on the land. They would just be crushed. The whales transition from four-legged land mammal to the giant of the oceans is one of the most extraordinary stories in the history of evolution. Has the mystery of whale evolution been solved? To some degree, but yeah. when we fill a gap, we make two more, and so yep. <laughs> we're always going to want to know more. Yeah. From the first wolf-sized creatures that ventured into freshwater rivers to the walking whales that were champion swimmers to fearsome marine predators to the largest animal that has ever lived. Very cool. Today, scientists continue to search for the missing chapters in the whale's story. There is more to find in Wadi Fitan. There are so many fossils still hidden inside the rocks, and uh, we're hoping someday to find very primitive well and very ancient deposits that can actually complete the story in whale evolution. That would be a really huge discovery. The whale's evolutionary cool journey is not over. Today, they must survive new threats that are driving some species close to extinction. Yeah. There are a lot of new challenges that the whales are facing today, whether it's fishing, ship traffic, noise, climate change. Anything could be a factor because if it affects their habitat, it affects their evolution. Exactly, and the challenge is evolution doesn't happen overnight. So we don't yeah. really know what the consequences of that will be. Whales face a precarious future. The hope is that they will adapt and survive as they have done for 50 million years. They will if we just give them the chance. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. How cool is that? So let me give you a link to this video there. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. Hope you learned something. I hope you got a newfound appreciation for whales and their evolutionary history. Really, really cool stuff. Really, really, really cool stuff. Uh, um, Spagnella Isis, I think I saw it before. It just came out the other day. So, unless you saw it a couple days ago, <laughs> chances are you didn't. <laughs> this is new. But yeah, yeah. Just on time for the end of the stream. Yes, Lenina, it is the end of the stream. I know some of you have more questions and more things to say. I would encourage you to hold on to those until tomorrow's stream. Lordy has made some lasagna, and I need to be upstairs to eat that in a few minutes. Or, like, now, really. So, let's go ahead and put a mammal here under our credits. A saber-toothed cat. Not a cetacean, but a... Uh, a Borotherian mammal, at least. And a Laurasia Thier, I think. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Another wonderful stream. I hope you had a good time here. I hope you learned something. hope you're inspired to learn more about our incredible planet Earth and the history of life upon it. Let's find somebody else to raid into right now. Who else is doing some science at present? Um... Let's see. Oh, Melissa in denial is. Let's go right into her. She's going to be going to Egypt herself. Before too long. I think at the end of this month. 
We just learned about some Egyptian whale fossils. So let's go see what she's up to. She's playing some Lego Indiana Jones right now. Melissa is an Egyptologist and an archaeologist. And if you've got questions about archaeology or Egyptology, she's your gal. Um, yeah. Anyway, we're going to go right into her, but thank you everybody for a wonderful stream. Raiders and moderators, follow, followers and cheerers, subscribers and gifters, and question askers and lurkers and everybody else. Thank you, thank you for your enthusiasm, for your help, for your financial support. I could not do these streams if it were not for, for all of you, so thank you very, very much for that. Um... I am deeply grateful. What a privilege to be able to. We came in search of dinosaurs, but we bit off more than we could. And Yogurt Garrel, holy cow! Yogurt Garrel and their seven raiders should have taken a smaller bite. I was thinking about raiding you, Yogurt Garrel. I'm glad I I decided not to. We're about to raid into Melissa in denial. Yogurt Garrel, how did your stream go? How did Tetris go? I hope it was excellent. It's good to see a Yogurt Garrel. Thank you for uh, for all of your support. Holy cow! Let's go see Melissa in denial, everybody. I will see you there. Take care.